طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Good evening everybody. We would like to welcome you for our event for today. Today we are going to talk about very important topic which is related to one of the critical problem specifically for Saudi Arabia, which is dust impact on uh, solar systems. So the, the, the forum today will have two parts, one related to the uh, technical engineering side, the other part related to the science and material science. Uh, we would like to welcome the vice president for KFUBM for innovation and research, uh, Professor Ali Sheikhi. Uh, we would like to welcome him to uh, give us the welcomes address for this uh, event. Father Dr. Ali. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fahad, for your team and your center for organizing uh, this important gathering or forum on an important topic, uh, which is the uh, soiling effect on solar energy application, the challenges and mitigation techniques. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to this important forum. Uh, special uh, welcome and thanks and appreciation to our distinguished speakers coming from all around uh, the globe, whether from here at KFUBM or from different countries. We really appreciate your contribution in this very important forum. I'd like also to uh, thank and welcome all the attendees to this uh, forum. First of all, I'm really happy to um, mention that this forum is really timely, especially with the big transformation that the kingdom in general is going on and plus also KFUBM itself. We are going through major transformation in academic and research sector uh, that started uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, lots of things has been happening in our academic sector, introducing many new programs, um, concentrations, new master programs, new way of delivering the, the uh, courses, and many, many other things. I cannot really talk in detail about the amazing journey of transformation that the KFUBM gone through. As the vice president of research and innovation, we also went through a major transformation in our research sector. We overhauling or introduced also a new centers in the research sector. We introduced around uh, 20 center in the research sector, spanning all of important areas like energy, hydrogen, security, um, communication, and so on. Um, one of the important factor in the KFUBM transformation is really to have an impact for research. Of course, we are still interested in the publication and the citation and in the patent, but if though all of these does, does not translate into an impactful research that will help the community around us and the humanity in general, it means that we did not achieve much. So this is our philosophy in the uh, new uh, transformation in the research sector. And we introduced, as I mentioned, a number of centers. We introduced a number of initiatives that will drive all our research to be an impact of research, but there is no time here to talk about all of our interesting programs uh, that we are governed. I don't want also to steal the show from the energy center here. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, one of the important aspects in all of transformation also is the energy sector in particular, and also the vision of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which really embarks on diversifying its economy and reducing its dependency on fossil fuels as part of the Vision 2030 program. Saudi Arabia is aims to increase the share of renewable energy in electricity to 50% by 2030. Renewable energy, as you know, uh, had always been a huge question mark as we have no control on natural um, reliability of the renewable energy is, is an important topic because we don't have some control on natural parameters like solar radiation, wind, etc. Uh, and the increasing frequency of dust storm, which is about soiling here, dust and 
snow, of course, here in Saudi Arabia, we don't have snow. Well, we have a little bit, maybe sometimes part of the year. But, um, and also bird droppings, shadowing effect, all of these will affect the uh, uh, BV and the surface of the BV. Uh, because of that, the Interdisciplinary Research Center for Renewable Energy and Power System at KFUM is organizing this forum to discuss and present the potential challenges and recent techniques to mitigate the effect of soiling and BV system. I think it's very timely, very important, and I'm sure that it will produce an um, excellent discussion and fruitful outcome from these uh, discussion uh, that will happen. I don't want to talk too much. I hope all the best for all of you and have a fruitful workshop and to enjoy it as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Thank Ali you, Shaykh. Professor Ali, uh, for joining us for today. You are most welcome. Uh, we would like to thank you also for your time and uh, being patient to wait, wait for us in your office until this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you allow us, Dr. Ali will uh, move to the following speech. Uh, so the following speech, just from my side, I'll, uh, I'm sharing my screen with you. And uh, what I'm going to present just very briefly about the challenges and solution uh, and the challenges of renewable energy and specifically solar energy uh, in Saudi Arabia. So uh, in general, there are general challenges, as you can see here on the left side, there are non-technical, which is related to land space, high initial investments, uh, social acceptance, uh, lack of uh, skilled manpower. And there are also technical challenges as you can see here. However, what is more specific for Saudi Arabia, which we are going to focus on one part of it is environmental condition. As you can see here, we have a lot of dust, especially these days. So this is one of the most challenging problem uh, in Saudi Arabia, which is soiling or dust accumulation on energy surfaces or devices. Uh, as will high temperature is considered a challenge for different reason. We are planning in the future to have specialized topic about it. Of course, there are other challenges uh, specific uh, for Saudi Arabia where we're also going, I'm going to cover it very shortly for your reference. So uh, the dust or siling, uh, as you can see, dust accumulation on the surface could reduce uh, the uh, transparency of the surfaces to large extent, uh, which is reaching to more than 50%. For example, one study here in KFU Beam, this is one study we conducted at KFU Beam. You see the dust accumulation after a couple of months. And we reached to this summary as a conclusion uh, for BV uh, performance. For example, more than 50% power output reduction was observed over six months of no cleaning in normal days. This study is conducted by my colleagues uh, in KFU Beam. Uh, a single dust storm in Ma on March, decreased the power output by 20% for all modules. Uh, the dust density was measured to be 0 0.0618 uh, milligram per uh, square centimeters per month. Uh, another observation is that the rainfall helps to clean the panels and restore the power output to much higher levels. And uh, we have to consider the rainfall is not frequent in Saudi Arabia. So, we, by fact, we need continuously uh, to clean uh, the surfaces. Uh, one of the other challenges here in Saudi Arabia is the high temperature. As you can see it here, uh, as the temperature increases, the efficiency decreases of the modules. Uh, we conducted some study. This is one of the studied uh, one, one of the studies we conducted in KFU beam, and you can see the impact of the temperature on the efficiency of the modules. Of course, uh, the impact is relatively near, uh, linear uh, at different solar uh, radiation levels. So uh, this what create to us first, it will create a reduction in the BV efficiency and the power output to be more specific. The other thing is it will impact uh, the life expectancy of the panels. So these are uh, some challenges. Of course, there are uh, other challenges uh, if you go through this one, 
why the why the temperature impact uh, the performance of uh, BV cells or BV panels. There are different reasons which needs uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, explanation. This is just for your friends for today. Uh, the other challenge here is about grid integration. When you integrate the BV panels or the solar uh, solar energy with the grid, it will create intermittency in the panels, and therefore. Uh, we need a critical solution, of course. You can integrate to specific level. However, after that, uh, it, it will be really a challenge for the stability and reliability of the grid. Of course, there are a lot of challenges uh, here. Uh, the other challenge here for energy or renewable energy applications in Saudi Arabia is the impact of the temperature on the lifetime and on the performance of the uh, batteries. So this is also one of the challenges here. It will reduce the lifetime, or you can see the performance up to uh, 50%, which is considered uh, really high. Uh, other challenge here we, is that uh, in terms of regulations and policies, this is also one study was conducted by some uh, one of our colleagues in the center. As you can see, there are different gaps. Still, we are needs to fill some gaps. Of course, some of them just recently updated. But anyway, in terms of policy and regulation, still we need to implement more regulations. So uh, overall, uh, there are different challenges uh, for renewable energy in Saudi Arabia. Our focus for today will be about dust. Uh, just if you allow me to introduce the center here in KFUB, as the vice president uh, mentioned, uh, we have uh, 20 new research centers or integrated research centers. And one of them is renewable energy and power system centers. And it has a specific mission, which is development of innovative and sustainable and energy efficient solutions, policies and program with social, environmental and economic impact, considering Saudi Vision 2030. And we have five groups. We have one group for materials, uh, one group for power system, one group for hybrid renewable solution, one for intelligent energy system, and one group for policies and regulation. I would like to give credit for that. Renewable Energy Material Group, who are which is organizing this event for today. And also, I would like to thank Dr. Ghassan, Dr. Abdullah, and Dr. Amir Al Ahmed, and Dr. Abdullah Sharafi for helping uh, me to organize this event. So, to move forward, uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Uh, so, I'm done from my side. I'm, I give some introduction. Uh, overall, uh, so uh, the overall program for today, each speaker will speak. Then uh, after uh, his presentation, we'll give five minutes for Q and A. And then after that, we'll move uh, with the following speaker. So Dr. Ghassan, can you go ahead? Thank you, Dr. Fahad, for uh, the very good introduction. Uh, so we're gonna kick off the, uh, with the rest of the speakers, but before that, there is, uh, you are kindly welcome to drop your question in the uh, Q&A box down there. The speakers will respond to you. Also, there is an important question uh, where we could find the, the, the recording of the event. Sure, it will be shared with you after, by the end of the event. So we will start now by uh, Dr. Bing Guo. He's an associate uh, professor uh, with the mechanical engineering program from Texas A&M University at Qatar. Uh, he's currently, uh, his research focus on soiling measurement, sensor calibration and impact of mechanical cleaning uh, on solar modules. So the presentation will be under the title of effects of dust and other environmental factors on solar uh, power generation. So Dr. Bing, the, the floor is yours now. Well, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Um, good evening, good, uh, good day, good morning to everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the, the meeting organizers for inviting me. I hope uh, my presentation will shed some light on, on you in terms of uh, the uh, research we have done and our understanding also 
the understanding of researchers in the community. Okay, here's my presentation. Okay, the, uh, the title given to me, uh, uh, which is quite fitting to my research is Effects of Dust and Other Environmental Factors on Solar PV Power Generation. And as you know, uh, solar energy applications projects have been implemented in the Middle East countries. Um, Saudi, I just pulled this from the news, uh, is going to uh, have a one gigawatt of solar PV power generation project. And where I am um, in the country of Qatar, we uh, have just installed a 800 megawatt uh, power plant. It's going to be connected to the grid probably sometime this year. And also, as uh, uh, Dr. Fahad has mentioned, we know in this region, especially in this year, in the recent weeks, there's a lot of dust. Here I show a picture. This is a picture that I took in the April of 2015. That was a major dust storm that hit uh, the, uh, the region. And you can see the, uh, there's a thick layer of dust covering the solar modules. When you have dust covering the solar modules, sunlight will not be able to reach the PV cells as efficiently. And this will cause the de degradation of the, uh, the power generation capacity. So recognizing that the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, has established a standard, international standard, the IEC 61724-1. This is the standard that, that provides the gold standard for measuring uh, how much soiling is affecting the performance of uh, solar PV modules. So basically you put uh, two identical solar modules next to each other and you keep one clean and you let the other one experience soiling, whatever um, reason it's getting soiled so that uh, you can compare the performance uh, between these two modules. One is clean, the other one is soiled. And there are different things you can measure about the solar modules. Typically people measure the so-called uh, maximum power point power or you can also measure the short circuit current. These are two uh, frequently used uh, metrics of the solar module that people use to um, compare the dirty solar soiled module to the clean one. And then when you have the quantities, you can get a ratio. Now, this is the rate metrics of a PV soiling. So people either use the uh, term soiling ratio, which is the performance of the soiled module to that of the clean module. Or uh, we, some people also use the word cleanest, clean, uh, cleanest or clean, cleanliness index. Uh, they basically mean the same thing. And also you can think of a soiling rate, which is how much the uh, thing, how much soiling deteriorates over time. And typically we assess how much that changes over one day. And then when you know the soiling ratio or the cleanest index, you can get the soiling loss, which is one minus that. So for a clean module, that cleanest index or soiling ratio will be one and soiling loss will be zero. So that's the standard method, but over time people have developed many uh, alternative methods because of the standard method is, just requires so much equipment. So we used a uh, alternative method. We started doing this in 2015. We published our first paper in 2015. And then since then, we continued doing research. And this is a paper we published uh, in uh, 2020, uh, which uh, reports the result that we collected uh, in a, a matter of uh, five years. So overall, uh, over in Qatar, we, we, real, we find that uh, the, the, the PM 2.5, which is a measurement of uh, how much dust there is in the atmosphere, uh, PM 2.5 in Qatar is, or in Doha is about 40 micrograms per cubic meter. And then the, uh, the PM, sorry, this is a typo. This should be PM 2.5 over PM 10. So PM 10 would be about uh, three times as much as a PM 2.5. Um, and then uh, uh, researchers have realized this is the most important uh, factor that causes the soiling. And you can see this figure on the right shows you how much the, uh, 
the, C, uh, the, the cleanness index change or decrease over time. And then periodically you see some reset. A reset is either because of a cleaning, artificial cleaning or because of rain. Um, and then we also collect the data and we differentiate the, uh, the result between uh, dust storm days, which is uh, defined as a, a PM10, the particles concentration for particles greater than 10 micrometers. If that's greater than two, uh, 200 micrograms per meter, we call that a dust storm day. Now, for example, today is a dust storm day and we have had many dust storm days recently. So when you have a dust storm day on average, you get uh, more than 1% uh, of a production decrease over one day. Now on normal days, non dust storm days, you still get close to about half a percentage point decrease in terms of a production. So that's a very, uh, very, uh, uh, very serious, um, uh, very severe um, impact on solar PV power production. So we, uh, our uh, research group was the first one in the world to uh, introduce a uh, aerosol concentration measurement in conjunction with uh, solar PV soiling uh, research so that we were able to uh, connect uh, these results. And this is the, uh, the, the, the instrument we use. This is a, a, a instrument by, made by the uh, company TSI. The instrument is called a dust track. Over the years, we were able to uh, calibrate the instruments that we know, even though it's, a, it's not a so-called a gold standard uh, measurement, but we know the ratio between its reading and the, uh, the reference method. So over time, you can see uh, the dust concentration varies over the year. Uh, or, uh, over the year, and so month by month, uh, there's, a, there's variation. You can see uh, in July, is probably the, uh, you have the highest uh, uh, dust storm days, but in April, you have the, uh, the least amount of uh, dust storm days. But that may change after this year. Um, but uh, the... PM2, PM10 concentration does not always coincide with the dust storm days. So there's some interesting uh, environmental uh, trade-off happening between these variables. So over time, that's uh, how things happen. But if we look at the individual days, for individual days, we're interested in the, uh, the soiling rate, the change of uh, uh, soiling uh, over one day. And this uh, distribution that um, uh, you see on the uh, upper left corner of the screen. Uh, this shows you the distribution of uh, the uh, uh, soiling rate um, on a daily basis. And you can see the, the most frequent, uh, which is the most probable uh, thing is this the top, uh, to uh, the, the highest uh, uh, column. And this is a, uh, uh, this is a negative value. So, and then you, you, that makes sense because on average, uh, the uh, soiling decreases or the soiling gets worse over time. But there are some days the soiling actually can get better over a day. And I'll explain why. The reason is mostly because of wind. Uh, when you have a strong wind and when the weather is dry, it is possible on a particular day, uh, the uh, dust can be removed from the solar module. And then on that particular day, the dust uh, uh, amount of uh, the solar module can decrease. So on that day, soil and loss can actually decrease a little bit. And this matrix shows you the, uh, the correlation between uh, daily soil and rate with many other things. And uh, you can see, a, uh, so this is a, the top corner is a Delta CI. Um, if you cannot see clearly, uh, my apologies, but I'll just read the top corner is a Delta CI soil and rate. And this one is the, the dust concentration in the air. So there's a positive con uh, correlation between the two. However, this, is a, uh, this cell is wind speed. So the higher the wind speed, the less likely you have a worse uh, soiling rate. So this is a negative uh, correlation between the two. Um, relative humidity also plays a big role in the uh, soiling rate on a particular day. So the more humid it is, the more likely your soiling is gonna get worse on that day. Um, and then uh, uh, if you have a dust storm, of course, it's going to be a bad day for soiling. Um, so on the right-hand side of my screen, this is another way that would present uh, the uh, result of uh, showing the effect of uh, wind speed and also the relative humidity. And so you can see on some days, uh, on most days, the, uh, the soiling gets worse, but uh, on some days, 
swirling can actually get better. That's when you have high wind speed. Um, so now let's focus on dust storm days. When you have dust storm days, um, in a lot of cases, because we have the, uh, the Shamal wind, I don't know if uh, in, our, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia, you also call it Shamal wind. Over here, I learned the word Shamal wind. That's the wind, the prevailing wind from the uh, north, northwest. And uh, so you can see this is the wind rows, the circular plot. This shows you, uh, the, each dot shows you one data point representing one day. And then the direction of that dot shows you the wind direction. The color of the dot shows you the, uh, how the soiling changes on that day. If it's blue, it's getting better. If it's red, uh, it's getting worse. If it's dark red, it's getting very bad. So you can see on most days uh, when you have a low wind speed, now the, how closer the dots are to the center is uh, uh, how strong the wind is. So basically the, the, this plot shows you uh, if uh, the wind is uh, strong, then you're uh, likely to have some uh, allevi alleviation of uh, uh, soiling uh, represented by these blue dots. And uh, we can also see um, so if you look at the, uh, the lower right corner uh, panel of the, this figure, this shows you a few things. The monthly average of a solar irradiance, and this is plotted uh, over the past uh, few years by month. And you can see uh, also on the right side, hand, uh, side uh, uh, vertical axis is the so-called clearness index. This shows you how clear the sky is to allow the uh, the solar radiation to go through the atmosphere. Uh, this is not uh, the, uh, the blocking effect of the dust on the, on the module. This is when you have, a, when you have dust storm days, uh, you can see the, the clearness index can decrease by a factor of 10. Uh, I'm sorry, by a factor of uh, 10%, which means uh, the uh, dust um, in the air alone can reduce solar irradiance reaching the solar panel by 10%, that's a lot of a uh, decrease in addition to the dust that's already on the solar module surface. Okay, so Dr. Fahad also mentioned rain, even though we don't have a lot of rain. Uh, we have found out that the dust we have in this region is, uh, is not so bad because it's uh, easy to clean when you have a little rain. So we collected the rain data and we uh, plotted rain data against uh, the uh, the recovery of uh, the cleanness of uh, solar modules. So basically you can see the lower left corner figure. Uh, when the curve climbs up, that's when the soiling gets uh, removed or restored. So the module gets restored to uh, a clean state. So when you see 100%, that's when the, uh, the module gets completely clean. And if you read the, uh, the horizontal axis, you can see the turning point uh, is about uh, two millimeters of rain per day. Um, so uh, we don't get a lot of rain, but uh, when we have a rain, it is quite likely we probably have rain that's uh, one millimeter, two millimeters over one day. So uh, when that happens, you can guess that uh, the solar modules near you actually clean enough to be restored to uh, full capacity. So that's good news. Uh, we also collected rain data, and of course, in the past uh, uh, two years, um, do not, uh, I don't have the weather uh, data uh, for, the, uh, for uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi is a much bigger country, but uh, in this little peninsula, rain has been very scarce. Okay, so we did uh, uh, some characterization study of the deposit of the dust from the solar module. So uh, my postdoc, Dr. Wasim Javid, he collected the dust from the solar mo module over a long period of time and painstakingly. And then we, we were able to analyze the, uh, the dust samples so that we know what is the mineral mineralogical composition of the dust. And also we know the particle uh, size distribution of the deposit of the dust. Um, so using something called the X-ray diffraction, and we apply some quantitative uh, uh, analysis uh, by a material scientist uh, here. Um, uh, his name is Dr. Kasim. And we were able to tell that uh, the most abundant mineral in our dust here in Qatar is, is, not, is not what people call sand or uh, quartz. It's actually calcite, uh, limestone. And then the next uh, thing is uh, dolomite. Um, and then uh, quartz comes in the third 
And we do have a, a little bit of quartz, the, 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 the shiny um, particles, but uh, uh, it's not the dominant component. We also found out uh, the particle size that uh, you uh, find in the dust on the solar module. Uh, the, uh, they can be as large as uh, about uh, 50 micrometers. And very few of them, only maybe 10% of them will be greater than 50 or 40, actually 45 micrometers. Now, this also depends on how old the dust is on the surface. The older it is, the smaller the average particle size on the uh, solar module. So also that the particle size varies over time. So month by month, the, the average particle size on the solar module is different. This is also has to do with the, uh, the wind effect uh, because the wind speed is different from month to month. Okay, so that's uh, the um, uh, what it's a very quick uh, overview of uh, what we have uh, uh, learned over the past few years about the soiling. So uh, um, we also realized that uh, you need to actually clean the dust off the surface of the solar module, otherwise you're going to suffer significant loss of uh, uh, electricity production, uh, perhaps in the order of uh, 15, 20 percent over one year, even if you count the effect of rain. Um, and then periodic uh, cleaning uh, artificially. So you do need to clean the solar module more than more uh, frequent than that. So people have uh, developed many, many different, uh, many, many uh, versions of mechanical cleaning. There are many companies that are selling these uh, uh, machines, including uh, one entity, at least one from Saudi Arabia, and then they call it the Nomad. Um, and then uh, there are different strategy of cleaning. You can clean it every day or you can clean it as needed. Um, I have not done extensive research in mechanical cleaning, uh, but I'm going to do something that's peripheral to this, which I'll mention in just a, a moment. Uh, what uh, I did uh, in terms of uh, uh, mitigation of soiling is uh, something called the electrodynamic dust shield. And uh, Dr. Malay Mazumda is the expert. Um, I started doing this um, probably two decades, three decades after he had been doing this. Uh, so we learned a little bit and then I was fortunate to be given a, a patent on our version of the technology. Uh, unfortunately, it's quite expensive, uh, even though we found that for, through field work, uh, it does work. Uh, it does uh, improve, uh, the, it does reduce the soiling, but uh, um, the cost benefit uh, is probably not sufficient to justify uh, commercial implementation at the moment. So as I mentioned, uh, if you want to uh, apply mitigation technology, you really want to be able to measure how clean you have, uh, you have, uh, you have how, how, how good a job you have done with your cleaning machine. So it's always a good idea and to be able to measure the, uh, the cleanliness of the solar module before and after you clean it. And recently, and then up until now, we, are, we have been focused on uh, image-based or optical-based uh, soiling quantification method. We have done laboratory work uh, in collaboration with my friend and also my colleague, Jim Ji, and our graduate uh, student. And uh, we also began to do some uh, field work using this technology. We also have other versions of uh, this type of uh, uh, research. Um, so one way that uh, this may work is that uh, you can imagine you can put something like this. This is a surrogate module into the uh, uh, solar power plant. And then you can send a drone flying over the modules and take a photo. And using our technology, you can get a soiling uh, of, of quantification of the uh, uh, plant that way. So to summarize, uh, soil and mitigation monitoring services are needed for utility scale um, solar PV power plants in the Middle East, Middle East in, in our countries. And uh, over here at the Texas a and University of Qatar, we have uh, learned quite a bit about soiling and we're still working on it. Um, we, uh, the work is uh, uh, sponsored by uh, the Qatari uh, funding agency. Uh, and also it's a collaboration between myself and uh, many colleagues and students. Um, so with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Um, I hope I did not go over time, but uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to address either now or uh, whatever the, uh, the, the organizer uh, plans to do.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bing. Uh, we have two minutes for, for questions. Uh, there is already a question here by Mr. Mujahid. He said, uh, what about the effect of humidity? You are being discussing the, the dust as a major factor. Is the humidity going to affect the? Yeah, so uh, assuming you have the same dust concentration in the air, if your humidity is uh, higher uh, today, then you're going to get uh, worse soiling today. Tomorrow, if your uh, uh, dust concentration in the air is the same as today, but uh, tomorrow if it's very dry, and tomorrow also assuming the wind speed is the same, then tomorrow a drier day will give you less additional soiling. Yeah, so higher humidity in general is a bad thing for soiling. You get worse soiling when humidity is high. Uh, thank you. There is another question. Um, he said, could you explain the soiling through image processing? Oh, there are, different, there are many different ways. So currently what we have published is we use a surface like I shown in the presentation, like a checker pattern, you know, the chessboard, black and white. And then you imagine if uh, that surface has a intrinsic black and white contrast. If it's clean, it's a very high contrast. If it's dirty, you put, put dust on it, the contrast will decrease, decrease, decrease. If you cover it entirely with dust, you have no contrast. So that's the basic idea. So if you can quantify the contrast and then uh, correlate that with the amount of dust on the surface, you have a technology. Okay, thank you. Due to time constraint, we're gonna take the last question, but please, I would like to remind the audience type your question in the Q&A box. So even if we are not able to answer it now, the speaker will respond to you later. So the question is, uh, what is the effect of cloud seeding? Somebody I'm sorry? Know? What is the effect of cloud seeding? Oh, what is the effect of cloud uh, seeding? Uh, cloud seeding, if it's not affecting humidity, uh, dust concentration in the air or wind speed, it should have no effect on the uh, soiling loss per se. However, so the, the cloud ceiling will block the, the sunlight, but that's a different, uh, uh, there's a different, uh, uh, we don't call it soiling. It's a, it's a, because that on that day you have low clearness number. That's the reason. So we attribute that to the clearness number, not the soiling. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Professor Ping, wow, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fahad, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you here. again, uh, Dr. Bing. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hussein Al Gahtani. You can start sharing your screen, uh, Dr. Hussein. Uh, Dr. Hussein, he is Associate Professor at Mechanical Engineering Department at KFUBM. He has a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from University of Colorado at at Boulder. Also, he has a postdoc that uh, he conducted postdoc at MIT and other university in US. Uh, he is a member of a research group that is uh, that is looking uh, into dust, turbulence, and sensing, uh, and how to develop state of the art cleaning techniques for solar panels. So today he will uh, talk about dust characterization and sensing. Uh, the floors, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Hussein. You can start with the presentation. Tfadal, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Abba Blaziz. Uh, first of all, uh, Hassan, uh, how much time do I have? Yes, Doctor, you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Yeah, including the Q&A time. Oh, so 15 minutes total? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the, my topic uh, title is about the dust characterization and sensing. Uh, I'm here just representing a group of um, hardworking uh, people, uh, Professor Yalbas, Hawa, Sharafi, uh, Ben Mansour, uh, Dr. Abba, and Dr. Hassan. Uh, so I'm just here representing the, the work of the group. Uh, so we'll start with the outline of my talk. Uh, so uh, I'll have a brief, brief introduction about the, uh, the topic that I'll we'll, uh, be talking about today. Uh, the major topic uh, is about this characterization in terms of size, uh, distribution, and composition. 
And then um, the second topic will be about the dust and the mud adhesion to the skin surfaces, primarily uh, the solar panel and uh, aluminum uh, <clears throat> uh, surfaces. Uh, toward the end of my topic, uh, I'll be uh, discussing some experiments uh, done uh, um, uh, for uh, dust sensing, uh, as well as a senior project, uh, senior design project uh, conducted this semester by uh, a group of students. And I'll conclude my um, uh, summary by uh, my uh, presentation by the summary of uh, main points. Uh, so we know that. There are several factors affecting the the, uh, the power output from uh, solar panels, uh, specifically this solar radiation, the wind velocity, rainfall, ambient temperature, humidity, among other things. One of the one of the challenge, challenging one is the dust accumulation. So uh, dust actually sits on surfaces and influence the per performance of solar energy. Uh, like PV panels and aluminum troughs. So it is very important to study the characteristics of this dust and uh, the effects of mud formed, especially in this uh, region where we have uh, humid air. So the humid make the situation even worse and that's need to be investigated. Um, also, uh, uh, the uh, dust adhesion on surfaces is critical in terms of removing the dust again from the surface and the after effects of such dust on the optical properties of the surfaces. So um, we are located in a special region where we have plenty of sun. So we, we are we're lucky to have that. But at the same time, we are in the uh, uh, one, one of the worst uh, location in terms of dust. So as you can see on the on this uh, uh, map, on the, so we have a very dusty uh, weather. So if I turn this on, turn the screen on, look at this. This is too much. I mean, and we're actually experiencing these days uh, sandstorms, which uh, last for a few, few days. So uh, these sus suspended uh, particles in air can scatter the sunlight, reducing the amount of solar radiation that reaches is the service of the, of the module. As uh, Suleiman, Elizabeth Suleiman pointed out, that about 50% of power output within six months will decrease the output, uh, will, will be lost if the surfaces uh, are not clean. So these are some typical applications where we experience, I mean, where we will we have problem with dust in solar towers, uh, parabolic troughs, uh, PV panels, uh, solar dish. So all these will, will experience dust accumulation in this part of the world. Um, so um, uh, we, we can uh, say that self-cleaning or cost-effective removal of dust particles from such surfaces still remains challenging. Uh, the dust particles absorb water vapor and humid air, especially in this region, and that form mud at the surface, which is even uh, very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to clean. Once the mud is dried under the solar radiation, it becomes even more difficult to remove the dust from the surface. Uh, therefore, dust characterization and sensing are essential, essential for, self, for efficient self-cleaning uh, techniques. So uh, in this slide, uh, we conducted some um, uh, characterization of, of dust here, uh, the local dust uh, in the Dahran area uh, using different approaches. So the, the, the table on the top summarized the uh, EDS data, there's a weight percentage, which shows the uh, different elements that contains uh, by dust particles such uh, as uh, silicon, calcium, uh, uh, sodium, uh, and so on. Uh, the presence of uh, chlorine um, in the EDS data reveals that the environmental dust particles include some salt compound, while the oxygen presence indicates the, pre the presence of the oxide uh, compound. Uh, this is uh, attributed to prolonged duration of dust in atmosphere close to the Arabian. Uh, the X-ray diffract diffractogram of dust particles as well as mud solution 
uh, has been conducted. Um, we see that the existence of salt and oxide component, compounds in dust particles, uh, as evident from these peaks on both uh, diagrams. And one interesting thing is uh, from this uh, diagram is that uh, if we um, leave the, uh, when we form the mud solution and leave that to dry out, some components uh, become different uh, just with uh, leaving everything uh, dried out. So um, uh, that, that's something that we need to look at. Um, sulfur also uh, can be associated with calcium and iron is likely related to the the uh, clay aggregated uh, hematite uh, in P203. Uh, so that, that's, that is in terms of the uh, uh, dust uh, components. Now, in terms of the dust uh, size, the dust particles are collected again from the local area here. Uh, if you look at the, the, the images here, we, have, we see several sizes of dust particles. Uh, and we see small particles that attach to larger particles. And um, the, the attachment of small dust particles uh, are related to the particle charges, which develop over uh, during the long duration uh, of stay in air. Uh, so small particles expo expo uh, expose long duration of solar radiation, and that may change or um, add uh, a charge to, the, to these small particles. So that, that's why they attach to larger particles. Um, in terms of the shape of the particle itself, we have two factors that we usually uh, rely on, the R factor and the A factor. The R, uh, which is the shear factor, uh, is, is the one that is related to the inverse of the particle uh, circularity, which means that if, if the if R is equal to one, it means that the shape of the particle is, is, is a pure circle. Uh, if we deviate from, from one, then we have a, a, an ellipsoid, which can be measured by the aspect ratio. And uh, the, the, this ratio actually changes depending on the size of it. So we found that for small particles, this, this sh sh the shear factor becomes almost unity, which is very close to a circle. But for larger particles uh, above uh, 10 micron, uh, the sh the, this R factor becomes three. As, but overall, the average size is around 1.2 micro, micrometer in, in, in our local dust uh, here uh, in Dahar. Then you'll have five minutes. Five minutes only? Yes. Okay, so any time. Anyway, uh, this slide shows uh, the pH concentration on the mud solution. So we have mud solution and we measured the pH and we found it for, for over a time and we found that after 10 days, that settles around 7.5. Again, the presence of pH is, will, will, will create a problem if it, if it is high concentration because that attacks the surface uh, of the, uh, the solar panel as well as the aluminum. Now, if we leave this to dry out, different uh, particles, uh, sizes uh, develop depending on the uh, rate of cooling. So if the cooling is, is uh, fast, we have smaller particles. If, it, if, we, if we relax that, we have larger particles. Okay, I, I need to go on. Okay, uh, this is a cross section of the, um, of the uh, mud accumulation of surface. We see that here we have a dry mud solution, which, uh, which is uh, the, the white region here. And that dry mud solution actually makes the uh, cleaning uh, difficult part. So after we rinse this, we clean the surface, we still have some crystals here and mud uh, residues here, which we, we measured using the AFM. And we found that the height corresponds to around 130. Uh, here. Also, we have a dip here. So they, are, they averaged out to be around 80 uh, nanometers. And again, the, the presence of pH makes uh, some cavities on the, in the surface of the, of the uh, aluminum, uh, basically in this case. Also, we conducted uh, the major the transmittance and reflect reflectance of solar panels as well as uh, aluminum uh, surfaces. And we found that when we have clean uh, surface on the left here, the transmittance is, is, is very good. And because of the dust accumulation, the, that is reduced, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, mean, not, uh, expected. But here, look at on the right-hand side, when we study the reflectance, we see that the solid line uh, represents the, the one uh, without, with, with the clean surface. Now, when we remove the mud, when we have the mud, it drops, of course. But even when we remove the, the mud, it stays low. So we, we do not return 
the uh, the original um, reflectance uh, percentage. So and that, so it is permanent. It, 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 even with, with the cleaning, the reflectance has uh, has has been damaged. Um, then here we uh, actually um, conducted an experiment to 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 measure how it is easy or difficult to scratch or to clean mechanically the edition. And we found that it is difficult with the mud, of course, with the existing mud, uh, as shown in this diagram. So I'll go over this very well, quickly. And even um, the drying temperature has an effect on the, the load needed or the work needed to clean the surface. So for example, if you look at this table, uh, this diagram here, the drying temperature, if it increases, usually you have very large temperature here, it, it takes uh, extra energy to remove the, the dust from, from the surface. Even the particles of the dust when drying uh, depends on the drying temperature. Uh, another experiment he's done here, when we scratch the surface and measure that scratch, the width of that line, it is a function of dry temperature. So for higher temperature, it becomes, the, the, the surface becomes uh, stiffer, which means, which is, has been seen here that the, the, the width of the line is smaller compared to the original length, which means that the, the surface becomes uh, stiffer with, with the, with the drying temperature uh, when it is high. Uh, that is for dust characterization. Uh, characterization. Now, for the dust sensing, uh, I'll just conclude within a few minutes. Um, the, the basic idea was to build an RFID, RFID tag that is suggested to be connected to each PB model so that we can um, connect that PB model with, 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 with a certain uh, uh, control room that measures the influential parameters. One of the influential parameters is, is, is the dust accumulation. So we can hover uh, like uh, uh, an airplane or even a drone to collect these data from the RFID tags, and we can convert that into a control room. But the basic idea of sensing the dust, the existence of dust, of dust layer on, on, on these electrodes actually uh, alter the electrical uh, properties of these electrodes. And one of the uh, properties that is been affected by the existence of dust is the capacitance. So we conduct an experiment in which we measure the capacitance with and without dust. Uh, uh, and this is the experimental, uh, uh, sorry, I lost all my files. One of the surviving file I found is this one. Uh, so when we put dust, that's an indication here. So we can calibrate the dust based on this quantity and reset. Dust. Okay, look at that. There's more dust. <laughs> and this has been patented, uh, and uh, I, I want to thank uh, Professor Muzumdar for giving giving me the, this chip. Uh, I used that for this experiment. Uh, lastly, the uh, group of students here at KFPM um, came up with a clever idea. So instead of measuring the dust or uh, sensing the dust, we can have we can measure the the, uh, the power output of a, of a solar panel and also the light intensity. If the, those are, are high, it means that we have a healthy situation. If the power is, is low, while the sun uh, light is high, it means that we have, we have a problem. It means that there's something with the, with the surface. Uh, and that um, we think of uh, start cleaning the surface. And they made a prototype uh, and they uh, um, showed that the, the prototype of the symposium two weeks ago here at KFUPM. So th that is like a cross check uh, without the need for the dust sensing uh, mechanism. So in summary, uh, I'll just summarize the main points that I have uh, uh, mentioned in, in this uh, presentation. So dust particles have different size sh and shape and significantly alter the surface of optical properties. Dust particles should be removed prior to the formation of the muscles. This is very important. Surface hardness enhances uh, due to small uh, size crystal formation at high temperatures. Adhesion work of dry mud solution and protective surfaces is high for high drying temperatures which uh, we've seen some figures uh, presenting this. And uh, finally, distancing is crucial to solar panel cleaning. Uh, thank you very much. That's all from my side. Uh, and the floor is it's yours, uh, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Due to time constraint, uh, if you have any question, please write it down in the Q&A section, and Dr. Hassan will answer you there. Dr. Hussein, there is a question from Mr. Engineer Ibrahim al Hassan about uh, sensing. Which kind of, of it is more uh, 
popular or famous? Uh, well, uh, the two methods that I've used so far is, 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 is the one I showed you. And we mm -hmm. found that the capacitance is very sensitive to even a small, small accumulation of dust. So if we, if you, if we are uh, interested in very small dust scale, then I think measuring the capacitance of electric circuit is, is a clever way. If we are uh, dealing with large uh, service areas, and uh, th then I think the light intensity is, is crucial in this case. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Highly appreciated for the well-presented material. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Abdullah Sharafi. Dr. Abdullah Sharafi, he is assistant professor at mechanical engineering at KFUBM. Also, he's affiliated with the center, uh, with the IR Center uh, for Renewable Energy and Power Systems. Uh, Dr. Sharafi, he is working in many different areas, including uh, cleaning application related to solar energy harvesting devices, uh, optimization of hybrid solar and wind renewable energy systems, and CFD and thermofluids application. Uh, the title of his presentation is Dust Removal and Self-Cleaning Application. Dr. Abdullah, please share the screen and start the presentation. And open the camera, please. Good evening, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. Can you make it full screen, please? I do. Sure. Is it okay now? It's fine. You can start. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Fat, for the nice uh, introduction. So um, uh, let me start by introducing the title of what I'm doing uh, uh, apart from this forum is the dust removal and self-cleaning applications. Uh, this work was done with the collaboration of our material groups. I can name Dr. Yalbas, Dr. Hussein Gahtani, Dr. Ghassan, and Dr. Abba. So uh, the idea here that we are blessed in this region with a high potential of solar energy at which we can build on to move and build more renewable energy applications to save the environment. Uh, in this case, we have solar and wind, however, this kind of distribution of people, as you can see, they are scattered in the kingdom. So they are located in some regions, maybe uh, some of them would be uh, out of the grid uh, or reach of the grid. So the idea here is to have a renewable energy systems which can be off grid in this case. So what we are doing in terms of optimization that we are considering the dynamics of the weather data and randomness to solar radiation, wind speed and temperature and their effect on, on sizing such renewable energy systems. By considering such load requirement, you should study what would be the optimum solution to have uh, the full coverage of the load without any uh, shortage. So in this case, for example, uh, we are building if this is the renewable contribution. So if, if you need 100% renewable contribution, the area should be here, which is involved with increasing the PV module size, as well as the number of the battery storage. Any system apart from this area will be involved with some failing at which some backup is needed or grid connection. Now, if we uh, build on this, this cannot be always true because we have also the uh, dust accumulation on surfaces. As you can see in this map, uh, this area, uh, is uh, subjected to many frequent dust storms and daily activities. We see that the uh, reduction of the PV panel as well as the flat plate collector or any solar energy harvesting device will suffer from the reduction on the, of the efficiency. So it is clear from this that this dust accumulation on uh, surfaces of the PV panel as presented before, they are reducing the efficiency significantly it can reach up to 47 as, as per the um, this kind of study which is done by senior design project student over like winter months as well as summer months so many uh, uh, techniques are used for cleaning involving with some brushing or uh, robots or uh, water jets as you can see if we can see the the uh, brushing is involved with uh, uh, you know, scratches in the micro level, which is altering the optical properties of the uh, protective layers. As well as if we see this uh, part is significant amount of water is needed to clean such surfaces, which is uh, really, really expensive in such 
location as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Why? Because it is almost desert and you cannot have this uh, uh, always available. So the idea here is to end with some uh, cost effective and uh, uh, way. Uh, before we do, the, we do this, we studied the nature of, the, of this kind of protective layer at which they are hydrophilic in nature. So if we see this normal surface, this is like a glass or polycarbonate, both will be applicable. So if we distribute the dust, so we try to incline to, to see the effect of the gravity and what will happen, as you can see, even with high inclination angle, the dust still there because of the high adhesion between the dust particle as well as the surface. So one idea is to introduce hydrophobic characteristics on the surfaces. So as you can see here, the hydrophobic surface is defined when the contact angle is more than 90. So at which we can see the surface involved with 150 plus. So we call it it's super hydrophobic. This kind of lowering the surface energy as well as increasing the wetting state contact angle will uh, reduce the adhesion forces of this kind of surfaces. So uh, we simulate this one, as you can see, we can see the uh, velocity magnitude within the droplet. Uh, located on the super hydrophobic surfaces. So such surface will reduce the adhesion forces. As you can see here, uh, it is uh, helping uh, to reduce the adhesion forces so it start to fall. Okay, this one idea, so by simple inclination of the PV panel, as well as we know that it's inclined by a specific optimum angle, equal to the latitude in this case, more or less in summer and winter. However, with this inclination will help to reduce the uh, accumulation. Uh, as well as it can be better if you have uh, the surface is in, in the super hydrophobic uh, waiting state. Uh, as you can see, it can be observed from this video that this kind of uh, cleaning, if we see by, due to the gravity, it starts at a specific locations. So it is related to like heavy particles in terms of the density, as well as there is some accumulation because of the humidity so therefore, it starts at a specific location. We, we observe this as well, as you can see in this kind of uh, images, like a sequence, so it happened in 0.1 plus uh, second. So it starts at this location at which one particle will come down and will start to push the below particle and it will create what we call the avalanche effect, like a snow falling. So this was uh, interesting to our team. So as we can see, this, can, this is the velocity of this the front particles, which can reach 200 millimeter per second. So uh, we observed this, as you can see, this is like a video. What we, we did here just to uh, see that this work can uh, be validated. So we uh, distribute some inconel powder at which they are heavy. So uh, as you can see, this is like inclination is happening. Now it is inclined. We have the camera which is attached. It's parallel to the surface. Now this is like heavy or large in size. This is smaller and this is smaller. And as we can see, this kind of techniques if you have heavy particles on the surfaces will lead to push the uh, dust layer down. And it will start from the heavy part and then it will follow by the, if I can, yeah. Okay, so as we can see, this is like pushing the, and cleaning the surfaces. So this work was published, uh, I think, in RC journal. So uh, this one also, the, as you can see, this video. I mean, if we don't have access to inclinal, so after that's like any ordinary uh, dust particles around, you can just throw them to, to over the PV panel. While inclination, it will help for the cleaning. So this is like a bigger dust particles nothing more so as you can see in lower like inclination angle they start to help the uh, avalanche effect to be uh, uh, to be cleaning uh, the surface this one application that we did the other part is like we introduced the water droplet instead of jet of water or significant water access we studied uh, minimizing the uh, water uh, needed for the cleaning at, and we we considered like if it is uh, hydrophilic, as you can see, it expected that uh, the velocity will be very minimal or very small in magnitude. And uh, if the, the dust is uh, there, the problem will become worse. So this is like representing what will happen in the nature. So even if you have rain, the rain is not heavy always. It is like maybe very light and this will contribute to make the problem worse. Uh, 
so then uh, introducing uh, super hydrophobic characteristics on the surface it will help to to the cleaning uh, for sure this is like a little bit high however if you come down it's one droplet can clean surface or a few a number of droplets can clean the uh, the surface so the inclination angle does affect as you can see we we st start like to investigate what would be the uh, velocity of such droplet while cleaning so uh, with like only two uh, degree uh, inclination the velocity was lower than if if you have more inclination and this is what we have and a very high uh, velocity also we investigate what will happen if you have uh, the droplet is located very close to the surface so it will go and it will clean more area than if you are introducing the impact so th this impact will be like bouncing if your surface is super hydrophobic. So it will clean like a little bit uh, less. So this angle should be optimized anyway to, to have effective cleaning even under the uh, rain, light rains. So uh, we move to the electrostatic uh, applications. So this work was done with collaboration of uh, Professor Hassan Gahfani. So as you can see here, this kind of uh, uh, video uh, is, is can be used. This is like from the internet, not what we are using. We are using this kind of board. So just to see the what would uh, be the effect of this electrostatic uh, uh, that we are introducing the function uh, like using a power supply, then it will be used uh, to, to in this strings to charge the particle up and with simple inclination, they will be removed from the surface. This work is showing like we are tracking some particles in different directions. And then we measure what would be the magnitude and uh, what would be the uh, forces that uh, needed. And this work also uh, has been uh, simulated. Uh, I move to another idea for the cleaning. So uh, here it's like water droplet mobility under thermal radiative heating. So this idea involves if you have a water droplet placed on some locations over the uh, super hydrophobic surfaces, as you can see here, the contact angle is high. So if I introduce heat on a bar, and this will give rise to the uh, circulation of the water molecules inside the droplet, okay? So uh, this has been done, and this video can show you uh, that, okay, introducing the heat will move this uh, water uh, droplet uh, through the surface, and this can uh, uh, um, give rise to the cleaning, as you can. So if you have a matrix of water droplet with simple like uh, heating from one side, but, uh, of course, this is like not patented and also not uh, uh, scaled up to experimental level at which we have the PV panel, but this is uh, in the lab. So we prove that this can be done. And this may be like a future work uh, in our group. The other idea is the motion of ferroliquid droplet under magnetic influence. In this work, I uh, introduced ferromaterial, uh, which is like very small in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in size. So these ferromaterials, they are there and I use the magnetic uh, effect, okay? So this is like was done uh, earlier. So as you can see, with altering the magnetic effect direction and strength, this will give rise to the ferromaterial up in the droplet. Okay, so uh, it can be altered, okay, but this also can be used to push the droplet to move, as you can see uh, in the late stages of this video. So by controlling the direction and the intensity of this one, uh, of course, we are using this ferro material to move the droplet on the super hydrophobic surfaces for cleaning uh, possibility. So if uh, we alter the direction more, so the droplet will start to, uh, to move. I, I was doing in this, uh, in this experiment gently. However, at the end, if it's strong enough, it will, it will detach. This will go out of the system. However, the droplet can be moved as you can see we can move the droplet okay this is just to show you the idea then the research has been done by the rest of the group i think uh, victor Ghassan and victor abba and myself so uh, what happened as you can see any using this kind of ferroparticle inside what, with a proper orientation of the magnetic field, 
So this droplet can be moved in the sliding mode in the beginning. And then once the ferroparticle is detached, it will go to the magnet. Okay, then it will start to roll after that. So this has been done with um, uh, multiple sizes of the droplet and it was validated with different con with the same concentration of the ferroparticle inside the droplet. Uh, now for the challenge, uh, challenges and future work, as you can see here, we have the water droplet simulated. So we have the uh, some rotation because of the combination of buoyancy, because of the different temperature between the water droplet and the surface, as well as the uh, surface tension and Maragoni uh, convection. So all of this combination will, will try to pick the, the, if you have like rain or any accumulation of uh, water due to the humidity in the atmosphere, which is frequently happening here uh, in this location. So what happened uh, if the dust particles are distributed inside the droplet, it depends on their uh, density. So as here, we are showing some uh, uh, simulation with different density, 857, 1600, and 3000. Okay, so as you can see, it, the strength of the uh, rotation inside the droplet does okay uh, influence the rotation however if the material of the dust are heavy and it, it differ from location to location so uh, the influence of this uh, motion will be uh, clear uh, affected by the density of the dust particle moreover with time this if the surface is subjected to humidity, so some condensation will happen, and this kind of uh, water accumulation on the surfaces also will be there with the presence of the dust. Some dust compound will dissolve in the water droplet, and this, okay, uh, the water itself will evaporate eventually because of the uh, lower humidity ratio at the day. So what happened? some mud will be formed on the surface as Professor Gahtani was uh, mentioning. So this is really a, really a challenge, okay? So one idea is, okay, you would like to clean, but what would be the, the frequency of the cleaning? So this need to be addressed, this feasibility study to be addressed, what would be the cost of, okay, of the reduction of the uh, PV panel output, as well as the cost of, and the frequency of the cleaning process. Okay, if we leave it too much, what happened? Because of the humidity, this mud will be formed and it is very difficult to clean it either by water droplet motion or uh, air drawn or whatever the idea. No, it should be mechanical uh, wiping. Okay, as you can see from these uh, images. So the challenges that we have is, okay, one is to secure like uh, superhydrophobic coating on the surfaces at which it is the, the optical properties will be still high for the water droplet, as well as uh, uh, some techniques to to work, okay, uh, in such a way that it is uh, not expensive in terms of uh, water utilization as well as labors. Uh, Sorry, Dr. Ab Rob, I, I finished. So this is some references. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for the very excellent presentation. We have three minutes for questions. Uh, there is already a question here, doctor. He said, how the surface inclination will affect the optimal tilt angle? Because you are showing us some experiments on uh, tilting the, the super hydrophobic surfaces. Okay, so and th this was done in the lab. Okay, so what do we have in the... Uh... Even my senior design project student, they are uh, doing some, some system for tracking as well as for uh, inclination. So the usually we have the uh, tilt angle for the PV panel equal to the latitude plus, plus or minus uh, 10 to 15 uh, degrees. So in the summer, it should be lower. In the uh, winter, it should be uh, higher to have like maximizing the solar energy higher harvesting. However, if your system is smart involved with some tracking, Okay, it can be inclined to help. For example, uh, we have discussed Victor Hassan together. So the idea here is to have like a once a day, you can flip your surface. If you have some clearly, some like uh, rotation system, you flip it by this, you are helping the gravity to uh, help you to clean the surface in, in, in some like uh, easy way. So this is one, one idea. So, okay, 
you have the inclination okay for the solar uh, panel itself to have them uh, maximizing the solar energy harvesting this can help in cleaning however if it is not enough it should be like you you have some system for the inclination to help this is one idea which is the, using the gravity as well as this avalanche effect can work in some cases yeah thank you uh, also there is a question by mr ali but before mentioning the question please all the audience could you drop your questions in the q and a uh, box uh, in order not to miss any question so mr ali's question is said nowadays they use uh, they use dry lean instead of water to reduce water co uh, consumption the, so if the idea is still working can you repeat using yeah, what his question is nowadays they use dry lean instead of water to reduce uh, water consumption what so, is what is the dry lean uh, maybe i'm missing the dry methods of cleaning uh, instead of uh, water based method cleaning because you, you are mentioning some droplet type of uh, cleaning so is the idea still working this is his his question I what think is the dry, the, the dry lean? Dry can, clean. can you allow him to speak? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, dry cleaning. You mean dry cleaning, not lean? It's dry cleaning. Yes. Dry cleaning, is it? He said dry clean. I mean the type okay. of. Uh, okay. Th this is. I mean, there is uh, an, an, uh, another technique. So I am presenting what we did in our group. So dry technique involved with this gravity tilt and uh, as well as the electrostatic, as well as the. Uh, uh, the, in MIT, they are introducing electrostatic without strings, so it is like working from far. So this is like uh, new technologies. So it, it is there, sure. Okay. So uh, the, the problem here is to have access to this technology one, as well as the cost. So if your system is losing something uh, for each month, however, your cleaning process will be involving with high cost. So at the end, as investor, you are. Yeah, for sure, we are putting oversizing of the uh, farms uh, to to give us some uh, flexibility in this uh, case. So all of this is subjected to economical study. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, okay. Dr. Abdullah Sharafi, for the nice presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Fahad, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, for the excellent presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Hussam. Qasim, Dr. Hissam Qasim, he is the manager uh, of the National Center for Renewable Energy Technology at CAXT. He has PhD from University of California uh, at LA, and he is specialized in nanotechnology application for energy harvesting devices. Also, he has uh, been uh, working different topics, different area like organic uh, photovoltaics, perfoscite, and solar cells based on 2D material. Uh, Dr. Hussam was the lead of the Al Khafji project demonstrating the largest desalination plant operated uh, by, by solar energy with CAX team. Uh, his effort uh, on product development focused basically in again a renewable energy system for a harsh environment and integration of a renewable energy system with high energy consumption application. Uh, the title of his presentation is Solar Energy Technologies for Allied Climates, the Dust and Anti-Soiling uh, Technology. So Dr. Hussam, the floor, uh, the floor is yours. You can start the presentation and uh, hold on, Doctor. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahd. Can you hear me? Yes, clear. Uh, does, this, does the screen looks good or? Yeah, everything is fine. Hold on. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, hi everyone. My name is Hussam Gassim, and uh, I am with the National Center for Renewable Energy Technology at uh, King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology. And uh, it's a tremendous honor for me to be here actually and giving me talk about solar energy technologies for arid climates. Basically, the anti dust and anti soiling technologies that we have developed here at CAXT. Um, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna mention the whole array of technologies that we are trying to develop here at CAXT. We're just uh, the anti-soiling technologies that we are developing. We have a story at the beginning where we developed and synthesized the material itself. And in the middle where we are trying to develop it and optimize it. And at the end, 
where, where, where we are doing field testing and uh, long exposure field testing. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about, which is the last uh, part uh, due to the time limitation. But I hope in the future, we have a more chance to, to talk about the earlier parts of our research too. So, um, so let's first look at the challenge we have and the challenge that we are aware of is that we have an increasing energy demand. And a big portion of that energy demand is electricity. So how are we going to cover this potential energy demand in the future is of course one potential way is uh, to have photovoltaic generated electricity. If you look at the installed PV capacity uh, globally, then you see that in 2020, we had around 773 gigawatt of PV already installed. And only in March the last, it has been announced that the global installment have reached the terawatt regime. So we can welcome the PV technology to the terawatt age. Um, with the growing installment of the PV field, the price of LCOE has also been coming down. We have reached a point uh, which is called grid parity, which means the prices of energy unit uh, generated from PV sources is becoming equal or less to the prices of grid electricity. <clears throat> and we can see that around the globe, from the West, in the United States, for example, in Europe, Germany, and also in the Far East, um, presenting an example here of uh, Japan. Uh, the MENA region is no exception. There is a high penetration of renewable energy uh, generation. The MENA region has the second highest uh, growth of renewable energy implementation projects. Uh, Saudi Arabia also uh, emphasizing heavily uh, in their vision 2030, um, putting a very clear objective of connecting the, the vision 2030 to the renewable energy objectives. So under the NITLIP, the National Industrial Development Logistics Program, which is one of the programs of the vision 2030, we have the objective of grow the contribution of renewables to the national energy mix. So uh, huge strides has been done into that. The Geometer Gender Wind Farm, it sets the world record for the least cost of electricity produced by wind. The Sakaka IPV, IPP project, the Sider project, a lot of projects are coming down. So um, uh, with, the, with the high implementation of the, uh, with the high implementation of, uh, solar technology in, in, in Middle East and uh, Saudi Arabia, the climatic stress factor reduces the PV lifetime in desert environment, as we said. The desert challenge, as we see, it, it's, um, it, it, it's stressing two, two times the irradiance dosage, two times the temperature change, almost four times the maximum wind speed, 50 times the soiling rate and uh, 20 extra temperature, uh, degrees temperature of ambient, uh, of ambient temperature, sorry. Uh, so uh, unlike soiling, uh, insulation or, or temperature, soiling is the third most important PV performance factor. And this is according to first solar. Um, so as we said, the vast development of PV in the desert climate has brought with it a new challenge as soiling is a key problem uh, in these areas due to high pollution, frequent dust storms, and infrequent rain events. The figure shows the particular matter map of the world indicating the degree of pollution. Uh, the abundance of airborne particles can be seen in Saudi Arabia, indicating potential soiling to the solar module and resulting to a power loss. Um, the dust particle can contribute significantly to the rate of soiling. I mean, a study that is showing almost 7% uh, loss of power could be reached by 2023 because of the high PV installation rates in air polluted areas. And um, we know that this is a problem that is all over the world from agricultural emission from Poland from uh, exhaust. Today we are hearing about someone uh, having a, a field around the cement factory and it's hard to clean. So it's really a multi-dimensional multi problem. And, uh, we invite more and more of the research community from around the world because it's affecting almost all areas of the world to, uh, to, to, to jump in and try to uh, participate. So uh, we need a solution for that. What would be a specific design? For example, we have developed an anti-soiling coatings here at CAX. And would that specific design of anti-soiling provide a solution for that? 
And I did a small study that we compared the anti-solution coating with other 15 leading anti-soiling anti coating from industry and uh, or research organization, and we have compared it, and we're gonna show that in the next slide. So for this study, I'm gonna show one small study that we did, which is uh, first I'm gonna do the experimental setup and methodology. Uh, the outdoor test setup was designed and installed at eight different locations, as shown in the map here in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the identical glass samples of thickness 3.2 millimeter and size of 10 by 15 centimeter square were prepared. And uh, for anti-soiling coated sample, the coating was applied on its front side by the respective manufacturer. As we said, we are comparing it with uh, other leading uh, manufacturer. In total, around 15 coated glass samples and one uncoated glass sample were prepared for each site. The samples were mounted at a 25 degree angle on the test stand for all sites. Um, at Al Khafji and Solar Village sites, the sample were exchanged every month Whereas due to logistical issues, um, Al Qasim, Riyadh, Mecca, Tabuk, Yambu, and Al Ahsa samples were exchanged every quarter. And the total duration of outdoor exposure continued for one year. And that's what we consider a strength of the study because it has been done similar study, but not as extended as one year. Uh, the total duration of outdoor exposure continued for one year. Uh, out of these eight sites, three are coastal sites. Uh, basically, Al Khafji and Al Ahsa are situated within the eastern part of Saudi Arabia on the Gulf, in the Arabian Gulf, while Yambur is located on the western uh, part, which is um, on the Red Sea uh, coast. Uh, the test setup was installed on the rooftop at uh, Riyadh and Al Ahsa, while on the other sides, it was on the ground level. Uh, we did a water contact angle measurement to exactly characterize the hydrophilicity, hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity of the contact of the anti-soiling coatings that we are comparing ourselves with, uh, because we are studying each anti-soiling some places very close to the to the coast and some it's inland. So that's why we wanted to first characterize the contact angle, and we have evaluated that um, uh, for uh, anti-soiling. Coating number two and three, the quadrant contact angle was above 90, which is giving it a hydrophobic uh, nature, while the other coatings was in the below the 90 degrees, uh, and it was the hydrophilic uh, nature. Uh, we do transmission measurement, the measure of the soiling loss. Uh, initial sample characterization was done through the measurement of total hemispherical transmittance at three position as shown in the figure uh, using the equation one. Uh, following the measurement, sample were exposed to outdoor benchmarking test at the respective site in Saudi Arabia. After the completion period, whether it's a month or a quarter for certain for the location, uh, the backside of the sample was cleaned and the hemispherical transmittance measurement has, has been redone. And then at the end, the soiling losses is determined by measuring the transmittance of the sample before and after uh, outdoor exposure using equation number two, uh, here denoted as L soiling. Uh, when it comes to the weather data, uh, I'm actually very um, uh, in, uh, amazed by, by Dr. Go, uh, Go uh, work on the, uh, and what he presented on the very uh, correlation of the uh, meteorological data with the with the soiling. And uh, I think um, it's definitely giving us an insight here at the research community and how can we be, how it can be beneficial to us. Uh, but for this, for the respective study, we didn't have uh, the dust track uh, uh, product that uh, Dr. Bo has, but um, we just bought the, 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 the weather data from online provider. Uh, within the study, we have included temperature, wind speed, relative humidity, uh, precipitation and particular matter, um, we have used a proven analytical model for due estimation uh, by Bayesians. And within this approach, um, dew can be estimated in any part of the world. Uh, the dew point temperature can be calculated from the relative humidity and temperature using the Magnus formula presented here. Uh, simple regressions have been done just to uh, carry out to investigate the influencing of other parameters to the soiling and the desert climate. 
Um, yes, we have uh, we are doing uh, uh, a linear regression for the monthly and quarterly soiling loss with the meteorological and uh, weather data. So the first slide of our results uh, discussion, we are just here presenting the bare glass, no anti-soiling on it, just uh, naked glass. Of, uh, these graphs shows the daily average soiling loss of the uncoated glass at different sites compared to the number of days with due average uh, particular matter and the number of days with precipitation of one and three million millimeters. Now, the reason for comparison with these parameter is because from regression analysis and pattern recognition study, these parameters were found to have a significant influence on the soiling loss. And we have uh, Dr. Guo also with his talk have also touched, touched on that, that dew and uh, humidity and is very much uh, has a very high correlation with the with the soil, and that's also we we what we found also. Not only that, but because also the dew, the dew uh, formula that we have as we go back to the equation, uh, we can see that it includes everything: it includes the wind speed, cloud co coverage, relative humidity, ambient temperature, and dew period temperature. So that's why we are using this three uh, parameter to for comparison. They are highly correlated and they already encapsulate most of the meteorological uh, data. So monthly, um, so the uncoated standard glass sample served as a reference sample at all sites, since the climatic condition at all locations vary, so the soiling loss vary. Uh, monthly, monthly sample exchange shows that Al Khafji, which is a coastal site located near Arabian Gulf, has the highest soiling loss reaching 0.31% per day, the area experienced a significant amount of dew. The frequent occurrence of dew along the particular matter resulted in high soiling losses. As the dew promotes the accumulation of dust and the consequent evaporation supports the dust adhesion. In comparison, the solar village uh, being inland and in central region and the desert area experienced low dew occurrence. Low amount of dew could be the reason for low soiling losses. Now this trend uh, for quarterly sample exchange within this five sites, on average, uh, the soiling rates are higher for coastal areas, Yambur and Rahsa, with maximum reported of 0.44% and 0.22% respectively. These sites experience frequent dew occurrences. It is it's, it's expected that the, the, dew in, uh, the dew occurrence along with the dust concentration has resulted in high soiling losses. In comparison, if you look at the Tapuk site, there has been a frequent occurrence of rain event, highest among all sites, which could be the main reason for low soiling losses. Um, let's look at the details of test location. We're just taking two test locations to just compare the anti-soiling uh, with them. Uh, let's look at the uh, fingerprints of two sites where there are a monthly sample exchange for one year. Uh, in the upcoming slide, the specific coating performance will be compared to these weather patterns, only to these sites, uh, just to zoom in a little bit on the site. Al Khafji, a coastal site located near Arabian Gulf, is high humid and experiences a significant amount of dew. Dr. Hussam? Uh, yes. Uh, three minutes. You have three minutes left. Okay, okay. Uh, while solar village being inland and the central desert area experiences low dew occurrences, the average particulate matter numbers and the wind speed are almost uh, similar, and the rain event are very uh, scarce and scattered. Uh, Al Khafji has a few similar, uh, have a few uh, rain occurrences in January to in the first quarter and the last quarter. Uh, the, 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 now let's look at the performance of the specific anti-soiling coating, one, two, and three. The graphs show monthly soiling losses of anti-soiling coating uh, compared with uncoated glass sample. Both improved and decreased anti-soiling performances can be seen for coatings. Coating one and two have performed significantly well with monthly average soiling benefits of 2.2% and 1.2% respectively. Average soiling reduction of 30% identified for coating one and two. Now, in contrast, uh, anti-soiling three has lower performance than uncoated glass sample 
with a negative monthly average soiling benefit of 0.86, meaning actually adding the anti-soiling uh, anti coating uh, number three didn't actually uh, reduce the loss, it actually increased the loss. Further comparing the trends with weather parameter, hydrophilic coating one has better performance in wet condition than dry. The opposite holds good for hydrophobic coating two. It, it performs better during the dry periods than wet. Uh, the last slide of the, of the results and discussion, um, uh, it, it's also the same, but for, uh, I'm not sure is it appearing here. Okay, it's for the solar village. So uh, looking at the solar village sites here, coating one and two have performed significantly well too, with monthly average soiling benefits of 2.4 and 2.7 respectively. Uh, Anti-soiling three also have been performing very uh, poorly. Uh, average soiling reduction of 35% for coating one and two have been identified. Uh, the same trend is being, uh, is being looked at here. And also it's the key derivation message. I'm, I'm short in time, so I'll just be a little bit quick. Uh, is that um, the, the, the performance benefit is significantly higher for a, hydro, a hydrophilic surface in a high humid area, while in hydrophobic surface in dry areas. That's the main, I think, outcome of our studies. Um, we have compared, as I said, the anti-soiling coating of CAGS with 15 leading, uh, the most leading uh, coatings from the, from the uh, uh, industry and also some research academy. And our uh, coating, we're proud of that, as is performing very well. I invite you to look at res our research at Solar, Mat uh, Solar Material uh, Journal. Uh, we have published a couple of months ago. And uh, the summary and conclusion of our work of this presentation, uh, performance of anti-soiling uh, coating affect, uh, significantly affected by the weather parameter, location, and the duration of exposure. Uh, improved anti-soiling performance for most of anti-soiling coatings. Actually, anti-soiling coating is doing is starting to prove uh, uh, reduction of soiling. Um, most influencing weather parameter and soiling where the dew, the particular matter, and the precipitation. Now, the, as I said, the key, uh, the key message or, or the most important uh, uh, deduction from the study is that uh, favorable anti-soiling coating for desert climate, overall performance benefit is significantly higher for less adhesive hydrophilic anti-soiling coating in high humid areas, less adhesive hydrophobic anti-soiling coating in dry or less humid areas. Uh, with that, thank you so much and the, the, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hassam, for the very comprehensive work done by CACS. Uh, so far, the Q&A box is empty. So please keep an eye. If there is any question, you can reply to them accordingly. And thank you very much for your presentation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Uh, thank you again, Dr. Hassan, for uh, well-presented work by CAX. We are also so proud CAX doing uh, a lot of work at different locations in Saudi Arabia and considering different regions. Uh, if there is no further question, uh, is there any question or we, we could move to the next speaker? No question so far, so we can go. Dr. Hassan. So uh, our next speaker here is uh, Dr. Malaya Muzmadar. Muz, Muz uh, he is a research professor at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Boston. Uh, he, obtained, uh, he obtained his PhD from the University of Arkansas Arcana in 1971. He is a life fellow of IEEE uh, since 2013. And he is co-editor in chief for uh, Particulate Science and Technology Journal. Uh, in 2011, he has been working in several area research areas such as material engineering, solar engineering system, uh, particle technology, and electrostatics enge engineering. He is a member of the American Chemical Society, uh, Electro Electrostatic Society of America 
and Material Research Society. In terms of honor and reward, he has he has uh, he he has the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for Electrostatics Society of America uh, since 2008 and R&D Award uh, since uh, or on 1988. His title: uh, Electrodynamic Screens for Dust Removal Applications. Uh, Dr. Malaya, uh, the floor is yours. You can start the presentation. You are most welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I am enjoying it very much. Uh, I have requested a student of our university who is uh, from Saudi Arabia, and he has been working uh, in our department. So she would be the one who will do the uh, uh, slide uh, sharing. Uh, Ud, are you in line with me? Oh, yes, I am currently sharing the screen. Okay, process. so would you start? Uh, she's a very uh, brilliant student and I'm enjoying working uh, with her. Uh, she's only doing her work in the first year, but I'm glad to see that she's interested in renewable technology, storage, and uh, how to keep uh, um, the solar panel screen. So start with the uh, slide. Okay. So in the first slide we show and we all know uh, that the water shortage is a big problem and we cannot create a, another problem solving uh, a one I mean, dust problem. So we felt that cleaning with water is not sustainable. So therefore we went to uh, developing a system where it would be water free. The next slide. Okay, so oh, it would be electrostatic, but the system is such that it would be maintaining the efficiency that you need rather than with water, you actually continue to work till it comes to a point that we, you cannot tolerate anymore, you uh, get started again. So the cleaning is not frequent enough to keep the efficiency fairly constant. So our approach is that whatever solution we take must be water-free as much as possible, and it must be uh, maintaining the uh, efficiency in a nearly constant level. Next slide, please. Okay, so now what we have done is to apply the electrostatic force. Now, there are a number of workers in work area. We started it long ago uh, to do this dust cleaning on the surface of Mars. Now on Mars, there is no water at all. So, you, you know, you have to do something else. So we started with the electrostatic uh, process, but we want to make sure that if we apply a very high voltage, it will be, could be a life hazard. I mean, it could be extremely dangerous for a person working on the field, trying to fix something and uh, get an electric shock, which could be deadly. So we thought that our device would be extremely safe uh, and there should not be any possible danger involved. So we uh, created a system where there will be embedded electrode underneath a glass film. That means the electrodes will not be, uh, will not be uh, in a way that it, it could accidentally get in touch with the human being. So therefore it will be embedded and it would be between two dielectric films. So based on this, we, came up with an idea that if we apply a three-phase electrostatic field, and I will not have time to go over to discuss how it really works, but it provides a pathway for uh, ion migration to the surface that charges the particle, and there's a traveling wave of the three-phase electric drive that cleans the uh, surface automatically. I have a video, but it appears that there could be a problem 
to show the video, but I will now go to the uh, next slide to show how this electric uh, electrodes can be embedded. So you see a hand here, and this is the film. Electrodes are inside this glass film. So therefore, dust is coming in contact with the uh, glass only, and the force is applied over the surface of the glass. It is a kind of a traveling wave. The uh, particles are moved uh, almost very quickly. The next slide. OK, so our objective is that we must apply the technology that can be commercialized, and we must make sure that uh, the system would work and we can produce it uh, in a manufacturing plan so that we can apply it uh, as soon as possible rather than just showing the possibility. So we worked with a manufacturing company and uh, we found that they are capable of doing this, and therefore, we are now going to the scale-up system. We can show it's a mid-scale uh, EDS film that we can apply on a medium-scale PV module. And now we are on the uh, way to put it to the larger surface. But you can also use the same technique, what they call tiling, that means you put more than one film to cover the entire film. So here we show that our goal is to reach the uh, full-scale manufacturing stage, but although a smaller scale can be used if you put like a tiles on a floor, and it takes only very small uh, energy. It's only 0.2 watt hour per meter square per cleaning cycle. And the total uh, amount of fun that is used for making it and to put it to on the surface and cleaning it should be uh, such that it is economically viable. And so with that, we uh, started working on it. The next slide will show uh, where we are. Okay, so we did that. We then could put it together on a panel or on a mirror. We started with a mirror because mirror is more challenging because on a mirror, any stuff, any dust that deposits, anything that you put, it uh, deteriorates the reflectivity of the mirror and therefore you cannot really use it. Uh, so uh, here is the uh, mirror and in between the mirror and the glass film, there are the electrodes, those electrodes so when they're activated, uh, the dust is removed. And here is a solar panel and these are used to uh, show how we can uh, move the dust away. Uh, and uh, I have some technical details, how you put it, uh, different types of electrodes, different type of method of uh, putting the films or printing the films on top and how we cover it. So with this one, I'm going to the next slide. So we are now using a electrodes that are made of copper because copper is much less expensive than silver or other uh, material. And the, it is a ladder shaped so that most of the electrode is actually transparent. And uh, this ladder shape allows the solar rays to go through, but not blocking it very much. So it is almost essentially uh, transparent. So we are trying to show some results that if we use the a total width of the electrode, 70 micrometer, and the electrode spacing is uh, 1,040 micrometer, uh, we can restore the reflectivity 95.6%, and we can restore the transparency, that means the uh, transparency of the uh, PV module back to 93.8% after the dust removal. So these are uh, uh, our very encouraging results with which we started uh, the work. The next slide. I might be going too fast, but I, I can answer if you have any questions. Just I want to show the basic uh, understanding and how we want to move in order to be successful 
in the uh, actual application in a solar field. So this shows again how you print the uh, electrodes by, uh, I used uh, Eastman Kodak and they have the uh, flexographic printing facility and uh, we didn't have to uh, make it. Uh, they had one uh, already in uh, line so we could just use their facility to print the electrodes. The next slide please. Okay, so here is the printing facility and you can see the clean atmosphere and we can get the roll to roll printing of the electrodes very fast. Uh, I mean, that the productivity is not a problem because this machine is extremely efficient and very fast. The next slide, please. So here are the electrodes and you can see that here is a panel and these are the, uh, this ladder shape are the glass, uh, are the electrodes. So the way it is this, we put a top flexible willow glass, it's a coning glass, 100 micron thickness, it is flexible. Underneath there is an optically clear adhesive and these are the electrodes. You can see these electrodes are a little bit far apart. And then there is a PET film, uh, polyethylene, tetrafluorethylene film on which the uh, electrodes are actually printed and is printed on two sides. And therefore three phases uh, completed by phase one, phase two, phase three, and is repeated all along. And this is your either PV panel or mirror. So now with this one, the electrodes are embedded between the PV panel or mirror and the uh, glass. And therefore you will not be uh, in contact with the uh, system. And so it would be very safe operation. The next slide. So here we show again how the electrodes are placed together and how the electrodes electrodes are activated and again showing that they are in between. These are the electrodes in between and there is the uh, top glass. And what we do again, we are trying to show this is the plate where we uh, put the electrodes on both sides, but when it is covered by the uh, glass film, it is completely encapsulated. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here, we make the uh, film that is like 30 centimeter by 32.5 centimeter. And this is laminated uh, on top of PET film and then covered by the glass film and the uh, PV module. And therefore we can put different uh, solar cells underneath the, uh, underneath that film, we can see those uh, you can see the, uh, those electrodes that are visible, visible, but they are under the glass film. Uh, so for we now activate this uh, glass film to move the uh, uh, dust away. So the next slide will show uh, that how we can use uh, smaller panels to cover larger surface. But here is the voltage source that is available from the uh, uh, power supply, and then we activate it uh, at 1.2 uh, kilovolts and to energize the electrode that are within the glass field and the uh, solar panel. The next slide. We show that uh, we, are, we are testing it in a solar field in Chile. Uh, They're working with us as a partner. And here are the electrodes uh, energizing system is a very small uh, system where we are putting uh, solar panels together. But the idea is that we can regain the optical power. It is the uh, optical power restoration output uh, at a very high level. But our uh, problem is to uh, realize it at a larger uh, module size. The next slide please. So here we are showing how we are testing it. These are the several medium scale and uh, panels uh, fully encapsulated. And then we energize it to uh, show that uh, uh, they are cleaning the dust well. We bring the dust from different parts of the world for testing. And we have a 
uh, environmental chamber over which we put the uh, dust uh, dusting and then uh, do the cleaning so that we can check it how well it is uh, working with a system that uh, can simulate the field atmosphere and then can uh, work uh, with the uh, uh, on outdoor. Uh, uh, Professor Al Katani, when he was at MIT, he visited our lab. And I believe uh, Professor Gould, uh, I don't remember whether he actually uh, could visit. Uh, I was probably out of town at the time when he was visiting Boston, but uh, he is very familiar with our uh, technology. Uh, the next slide, please. So, uh, what do we do? We are manufacturing it with Eastman Kodak Company with their flexographic printing system with copper micro wire electron, which is much less expensive than other electrons that we can get. And our design is including willow glass at top and then the uh, film structure with the uh, electrodes. And then we put the uh, solar mirror or PV. So this uh, put it, the system totally encapsulated. We uh, make the power supply. Uh, so uh, we get the left scale EDS film from Kodak. We laminate it in a laminator. It's an industrial laminator, uh, the vacuum laminator that we can uh, put it together. And then we test it for mirror or for uh, solar panels and see how well it, it is working. And this all work was done uh, uh, a few years ago with the uh, support from, from the Department of Energy. The next slide. And this shows that uh, specular reflectivity restoration, and this shows the optical power restoration for uh, different test modules. And this shows these are over 90%, but these are again the lab uh, atmosphere after dusting and after removal. But in a real field, uh, we know it will not be always working very properly. And therefore we are testing it uh, as much as possible to see its durability and its uh, weatherability, whether an UV radiation will cause a problem. So we are uh, trying to work with industries uh, for actual field evaluation. Uh, I, uh, I don't know whether we got the uh, video together, but the, uh, let's see the next slide. Okay, so uh, our uh, approach is that as long as you can manufacture and show its durability and we can do the operation uh, fully automated so that it will, uh, like we saw very nice papers on the understanding of the uh, dust accumulation, whether we can do the uh, sensing and uh, test it and actually check it whether it has cleared it so that our goal is to not only test that it is ready for uh, dust removal, but we can also find out that it is working well. The next slide. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, our approach is that uh, we are not using uh, the very high cost uh, transformers or expensive high voltage system. We are using uh, relatively low voltage, not going over 1.2 kV. And that is also totally enclosed so that no one would be able to touch it unless they break it. But the power supply is such that it is designed in a way that even if accidentally some of the students will check it and they get kind of sensible uh, shock, uh, shock, but it doesn't do any harm because it, it is a design in the system that it cannot deliver any power uh, or energy that could be detrimental for any uh, people to work on. And so uh, our goal is to have a very robust uh, testing uh, procedure. And so far, uh, what we are testing is working okay. The next slide. Uh, we want to tell you that uh, we could come up to this stage with the support from the Department of Energy, uh, Corning Glass uh, is a Corning Research and uh, Center for Development. 
and Eastman codec, and Sunday National Laboratory where we do most of the testing. And also this company, EDS Chile, uh, they uh, helped us with a deal by testing in their uh, solar field, and also Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Recently, we were working with Saudi Aramco, and they're showing strong interest. And we started the work, but the pandemic halted it for a while, but we hope we'll be successful uh, in demonstrating the uh, device in Saudi Aramco. And I believe this is the last slide. Uh, would, do you have any other slide? No, Professor, correct. This is the last thing. Okay, okay. So uh, I rushed, uh, and, uh, but if there's any question or any comments, I would like to uh, respond to that. Yeah. And uh, I have some uh, videos, but it's okay. Uh, uh, you have seen probably such videos uh, before. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mazumdar, for the very excellent presentation. Uh, always there is a question, doctor, uh, in such like EDS type of application, can we, is it recommended to like uh, have a type of hybrid type of uh, solution or mitigation techniques? For example, adding a layer of uh, an anti-souling layer or a super hydrophobic layer. Uh, so we get the benefits of both the, the, the uh, special characteristics of the top layers on BV panels, as well as the EDS screens. Is okay. it recommended? Yeah, yeah. So our approach is that, uh, uh, let me give you a kind of industry prospect. The industry currently or conventionally, they are producing uh, solar panels. So they are doing uh, with an IEEE uh, standard. So they really, really do not want to sell anything on top of it. So what do you understand working with the companies manufacturing EDS uh, module, I mean, PV module, and they want to sell it the way they make it. So what we do, we make the film and all you do put the film on top. So we want to make the, the process simple enough so that you can just put the film on top and either as a tile or if it is smaller panel, uh, you can use uh, you to just to cover it and energize the electrode. Therefore the two things are separate. And I understand your approach is a very nice approach but what happened is this, that industry is very hesitant to sell something with something. Uh, they feel somewhat uncomfortable. And you understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, there is another question by Abu Sabit. He said, uh, what is the effect of the resulting field from the electrode on the movement of the electron liberated from the solar panel? The, the processes, uh, we have tested and retested several hundred times so that if there is any residual effect, uh, we could not find it. The way it is that regardless of what you do, the glass top surface has some conductivity. That means it is not like a Teflon that its conductivity is extremely poor. So there is enough leakage. That means what we do, we, want, we charge the particles with positive charges. So the question is, if the charges will remain either positive or negative, will it have, have any effect? No, it doesn't have because the charges leaks away very quickly. Therefore, uh, it is robust in the sense that uh, it will operate as frequently as needed. Normally, you need to operate it maybe once in two or three days, or even operate it once in, I mean, once in a few minutes, that's fine. So uh, it is that way can be used uh, as frequently as you need. That was our goal. And again, I appreciate your question though. So thank you very much. Uh, we have another two minutes for question Q&A. Uh, there is no question. So, so I would like to say thank you again, Prof. Mazumdar. If there is any question, of sure, uh, we're gonna respond to it. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation.
<laughs> you are very much Thank welcome. You. We Thank you. Dr. Fan. Thank you again, uh, Professor Muz, uh, Muz Mandar. Uh, well, well presented the information uh, with rich a lot of uh, data. Thank you again, Dr. Malaya. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Shafiq Rahman. Uh, Professor Shafiq Rahman, he has PhD from University of Pretoria at South Africa. Also, he is a research uh, uh, engineer at the Center for Renewable Energy Power System at KFUBM. He has more than 30 years of research experience in the surface and upper area meteorology, uh, wind, solar, and geothermal energy assessment, wind, beefy, diesel, hybrid system design, um, meteorological data measurement, uh, global warming issues, uh, and trending. He has published more than 270 research papers in journals and conferences. And he has more 12,000, more than 12,000 citations, and with each index uh, of around 52. He won uh, Al Marai uh, Award as a national award for uh, at 2017, and uh, also he got distinguished uh, researcher award from KFUBM twice. Uh, the title of his presentation is "Experimental Demonstration of Drone-Based Cleaning uh, of the Panels." So the floor, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Shafiq Rahman. Uh, you can start with the presentation. Can you share the screen, Dr.? Okay, excellent. Can, can you make it full screen? Father Doctor, you can start. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Father Doctor. Yeah. So I would like to thank all the speakers for their very uh, 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 rich uh, any uh, uh, presentation with the, uh, all type of technologies which have been uh, developed uh, in the area of cleaning the PV panels. Uh, so here I would like to shed light on the meteorological part of uh, uh, of the um, why do we need the cleaning and how do we do the cleaning available technologies existing. Uh, 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 and being used. And I'll also like, as Dr. Fahad introduced about the uh, PV based, uh, this uh, drone based cleaning of the panels. Uh, so here I move to the next slide. Uh, this is a background in Western Asia, Saudi Arabia constitutes most of the Arabian Peninsula uh, with a lot of uh, total area of 2.25 square kilometer, of which about 38% is desert land. The country is classified arid with the exception of southwestern region. Summers are extremely hot and dry. So these are both of the factors which really contribute towards the, uh, the uh, creation of the dust and then reducing the uh, panel deficiency. In winter, the temperature varies from eight to 20 degrees Celsius in interior parts and in the coastal area, 19 to 29. And then since 1950, a journal warming was reported in the country varying uh, from 1.15 degrees Celsius in Tabuk, Makkah, and al region to 0.75 in Hamis, Mashed, Wadi, al Dawase, et cetera. Uh, the mean pre precipitation in most of the part of the country is less than 10 millimeters throughout the kingdom. Uh, oh, but, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the mean precipitation in most of the part is less than 10 millimeters. And then uh, throughout the year, while 400 to 600 millimeters in the southwestern part of the kingdom. Uh, this is the uh, variation of the temperature over different months of the 
and the preci precipitation. This is actually average uh, temperatures over the uh, entire kingdom. So like uh, you can see May, June, July, August, September, they are the hot uh, months. These are the uh, location where we are measuring the dust storms, recording the dust storm in the kingdom. Uh, so the green dot shows the number of dust storms less than 100, and these red dots shows the number of storms, dust storm more than 100. And these are again uh, showing uh, these stations with the topographical feature. Uh, the sun is the dust storm events are natural hazards and typically occur in arid, semi arid, and desert areas. These are highly correlated with temperature and uh, least with the precipitation. And this implies that higher number of SDS are expected during summer. A total of 2,648 of such events were recorded at 25 meteorological stations. The highest number were 218 in 1992 and uh, 196 in 1991. The lowest were 29 and 30. And the stations in Northern are Aljo, Frafa, Toref, and Eastern, Kaisume, and Asa area. The recorded events maximum number were 1800. 847 events were observed in the Western and Southern regions of Saudi Arabia during 1985 to 2014. With regard to seasonal variation, a total of these 1372, 540, 462 uh, events occurred in spring, summer, winter, and autumn. Similarly, seasonal uh, SDS trends were reported in the eastern and northern part of the Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is another uh, uh, table showing the data from the Saudi statistical books. And it is giving the more detailed number from between 2010 to 2017. So if you can see, there was 212 events only in 2012, uh, whereas SDS is concerned. So the PV panels, uh, the, what is the effect of this? You know, uh, uh, PV panels require minimum maintenance once installed and last for 25 to, 25 to 30 years, but it is still important to keep them clean to continue achieving optimal power generations. Accumulated dust and dirt on solar panels can result in soiling energy losses of up to 7% annually in parts of the US, around 50% in the Middle East. So how should the panel be treated to remove the soiling? So this is one study we did at KFP and BG. If you see on the right side, a gentleman is there. We have this PV panel, this is five kilowatt PV system, and uh, we saw during the month of July, uh, so these, this way the, uh, the, the daily power output decreased up to this stage, okay? So this is the effect of uh, dust we can see here, and this is another figure showing in the August month, the effect of the, uh, this thing, uh, dust. And so you see the, the, these panels on the left down side and the uh, uh, right side, this uh, panel, these are the dust laden, you know, and uh, uh, the panels. So we can see the severity of the problem, how important is that to keep our panels clean and is still keeping the uh, 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 safe, in, is make sure that they are not damaged, okay? This is another example. We have a hybrid power system. PV, wind, diesel, uh, with battery backup, and uh, we we see this type of thing, and we have noted, recorded the loss in power in this uh, from this uh, system. Solar panel screening is the process of removing accumulated elements, including dust, bird droppings, and ashes from wild fires from the panel. This process is implemented to recover power conversion capabilities of PV where accumulated particles act as an obstruction between the sunlight and the panels. Moreover, various methods are applied within the process across the applications due to their effectiveness in recovering module efficiency and further providing improved power outputs. So wet, these are the different methods, wet cleaning, uh, dry cleaning, process like electrostatic mode of operation, manual, autonomous, 
or application residential commercial so these uh, application will change based on the application size and all those so all of these uh, technologies has been presented by different experts as we see this evening and uh, uh, i will here emphasize something uh, on the this market side and then i will move to pv based cleaning uh, no, drone based cleaning uh, solar panel cleaning market size exceeded us dollar 560 million in 2019 and estimated to achieve over 11% CAGR through 2026. Rising solar PV installation strengths along with decreasing overall unit cost will drive the industry potential. Growing focus towards panel efficiency optimization followed by increasing renewable integration across the globe, global energy mix will positively stimulate the industry landscape. Uh, these are the some, you know, market trends uh, which uh, i think all of us know uh, like in global market in 2019 560 million and then with this it will reach to 1 billion 2026 so the aspect uh, the the problem is important to be addressed uh, <clears throat> this is the asia uh, asia pacific region will dominate the solar panel cleaning markets okay. Uh, this is the self-cleaning methods for PV. So we have the coating methods, electrostatics, and mechanical methods. So these are the, uh, just uh, uh, showing you the different uh, methods uh, at a glance. So these are some of the existing technologies, like you have water sprinklers uh, with the time, timer, you can use this. But again, uh, this is the water, uh, uh, water uh, uh, intensive system. And then electrostatic cleaning, we have gone through this uh, presentation, uh, is uh, named harvesting electricity. Electrostatic charge material is used on transparent plastic sheet or glass that covers the solar panels. Sensors monitor dust levels and activate the system. The dust is shaken off the solar PV panel when electrically charged wave breaks over uh, the surface material. This is not a safe way of uh, homeowners who are using solar panels because the panels shakes, which may lose uh, its connection to the roof and could fall down the cause and may cause the injury. Uh, this is a manual cleaning. Uh, and these are some robotic cleaning. Of, also, they use the water. These are the existing uh, uh, methods and water uh, less vibration scientists at higher Edward university in scotland and in the uh, project funded by nasa in the us have developed ways to cause solar panels to vibrate to shake surface dust loose the harriet ward solution attaches a direct current motor to the back of the panel that can be tuned to induce vertical vibration and then nine nanoparticle coatings. Uh, the scientists at the International Advanced Research Center for Powder Metallurgy and New Materials, Units of India's Department of Science Technology have developed a solar panel coating to prevent dirt from accumulating in harsh environment. In India, PV panels efficiency is affected by combination of high temperatures, high humidity, and high pollution. The nanoparticles based technology repels dust so that it can easily wash off with water and is highly transparent so that the coating does not reduce panel efficiency. So this is a, a drone uh, method cleaning. Uh, one of our uh, student, undergrad student, they did a senior project and they used a very small, you know, this drone to clean the panels at our KFPM beach. Uh, and it has a camera also, and it has a thermal camera as well. Uh, the thermal camera can spot the hot spot uh, on the panel, if any, and also the uh, the, uh, can, the other camera also can take the photograph if anything left over is sticky on the on the on the panel and can report through artificial intelligence, uh, you know, reporting and alarm to the control room. So these are the uh, uh, students, they did an experiment. 
say they they used a panel and they put the dust on these different quantities like this shows, slide shows a 20 ml of the dust they just put on this and then uh, they, they, they they use the drone to uh, clean that so if you see on this uh, right side figure on the one so easily uh, slowly and in first stage second third and fourth almost clean you know so uh, it is just uh, you can see uh, a small video So uh, like this is uh, showing the effective uh, uh, cleaning with the, uh, with the, with the, this. Why, I mean, do we need to have a way like uh, uh, drone based cleaning? So you see these type of uh, big forms coming into existence. This is the, in Saudi Arabia, this is the 10 megawatt uh, peak power plant in uh, Saudi Aramco. Uh, near Midra building, okay. So there's a, a thousands of the panels are there. So cleaning by robots, how much effort, how much uh, uh, is required, and cleaning with the other, you know, electrostatic methods also cleaning such a big form. How I mean, uh, it is practical. So we think that if we use the drone-based cleaning, I think it will be combined with some, you know. Uh, 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 water-based cleaning, uh, depending on the message we receive from the uh, from the from the drone. Okay, so uh, that can optimize the utilization of uh, the water, you, and at the same time, can be effective uh, 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 and faster way of cleaning uh, uh, cleaning the panels, large field of the panels. This is one of the uh, first uh, green powered gas well in Saudi Arabia. So again, mid of the desert there, you know, you can use this, uh, you can leave this uh, uh, drone there, you can program that and it can uh, sense through the camera uh, the dust situation and can clean, uh, uh, can uh, go and take, clean the panels, you know. I, I mean, it's, uh, if you are not there even. And these are some of the existing power plant in Saudi Arabia, 500 kilowatt installed capacity PV power plant in Farsan Island near Jizan. And these are 3.5, 1.8 uh, Kasparex uh, uh, PV power plants. And this is 300 megawatt in Sekaka. So it's a huge field. I mean, uh, I, I, it can, I mean, I, I don't know how can we use these uh, robots and all those to clean such big, uh, big fields and what uh, uh, infrastructure, how it will be maintained. So that looks, you know, it's still a question mark to me. Uh, so uh, I think if we also move towards uh, more efficient uh, uh, way of using uh, drones, because here we are not putting any additional uh, something, we are using the, uh, the thrust of the of the of the uh, drone itself only, nothing additional. The only thing we have a camera, and then we can program it with using AI techniques. So uh, this we find, you know, one way of doing it, and we see that here in Saudi Arabia we have these uh, power PV, solar PV plants, which are being uh, some of them are already in place, some are under planning and and different stages of development. So we are going as a kingdom on a high, a big way for, for implementing these projects. And then we have to really think seriously uh, what could be the bad third, you know, there are research and the different technologies are available, but we have to see which is going to serve our purpose. Uh, and also, you know, this dust is going to affect our wind turbines as well these uh, sand particles, you know. So if the leading edge of the wind turbine blade is, uh, is, uh, leading, is eroded, I mean, then we lose the power around 25%. So uh, we have to uh, think in a big way, I think, uh, to, to, to come across a solution, practical solution and doable solution uh, to serve the purpose 
I think this is what I had from for today's presentation. Uh, so I can, I'm ready to answer the questions from the audience. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Shafiq Rahman, for the very excellent work and showing us a new technique of uh, uh, removing or uh, cleaning the surfaces from the dust. Uh, there is a question, Doctor. Actually, when it comes to drone cleaning, there is always a question, is it going to perform well in a humid environment, especially we are here in the, we are facing some humid months. So the problem usually comes from the, the dust that mix with the humidity, forming a mud layer, and under the temperature, it gets, uh, it gets hard to, uh, it gets dried and it becomes very difficult to remove from the surfaces. So uh, is the drone can perform well in such harsh environment conditions? Uh, well, this is a valid question, very good question. And uh, we know that we, we did this experiment at KFUPM Beach, which is the highly humid area, right? Uh, so if we do cleaning every day, it's a certain hour of the day, uh, so it will minimize the effect of the humidity. But again, this, uh, we have intelligence system there, will inform you if there's something is sticky. So as I said, in combination with water uh, cleaning, you can, because that the drone will tell you which panel is, you know, having dust not removed, you know, and or something is sticky there. So you can uh, go and clean that. So it's a basically in such environments, uh, you have a combination of uh, combination of drone and the, and the, and the uh, water based cleaning. Did I answer? Yeah, you answered it very well. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question actually in the in the in the uh, in the chat here, but it's showing the same. It's like you know uh, the same question that we asked is concerning also the the humidity and the the degree of dryness of the dust. So uh, thank you very much. Answer it. Yeah, actually, this is a humidity we okay. have in the eastern region, but most of the part of the like Riyadh region and all those where we need these P panels more effectively to be used in the northern part, we have uh, less and less uh, humidity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent uh, presentation and Dr. Fahad. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shafiq Rahman for your presentation. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Ahmed Balawi. Dr. Ahmed, he is the R&D manager in the innovation department of aqua power with extensive research experience in the field of solar photovoltaics and green gases uh, during this time he established a broad network in the industry by elevating various emerging solar technologies and innovations and setting the agenda for new product uh, assessment uh, he was awarded his phd in material science and engineering from KAUST where he explored the new concept for elevating the performance of organic photovoltaics technology and published over, uh, than, uh, over 15 papers in major peer-reviewed journal. He received his uh, Master of Engineering degree in Master of uh, Science and Engineering from University of Toronto and B.S. in Mechanical Engineering from King Fahad University. Uh, we would like to welcome uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, his the title of his presentation: "Soiling uh, Challenges uh, in Utility Scale Beefy Project: Current Solutions and Future Respect uh, in Saudi Arabia." Uh, uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Ahmed. You can start uh, your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fahad. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, very clear. Okay. Thank you so much. First, I would like to thank you for this great initiative. Um, I think it's a great platform for knowledge sharing, and especially for uh, young students who are motivated to tackle these challenges. So um, after I realized that I was the last speaker of the session, I actually intentionally did not include in my presentation any, uh, any slides related to the soiling challenge, as the soiling challenge has already been covered by the respectful speakers before me. So I will only talk about basically the how aqua power tackles the, uh, these challenges. But before before I jump into this uh, topic, I would like to first give an introduction about aqua power. 
Aquapower is a Saudi developer, investor, and operator uh, of power, desalinated water, and green hydrogen plants. Uh, we have 65 assets uh, comprised of 43.4 gigawatts of power and 6.4 million cubic meter per day of desalinated water. Uh, we heavily rely on uh, innovative approaches, which allows us to win bids with world leading track record in terms of uh, pricing and reliability. So, as I mentioned in the previous slides, we have 65 assets in 12 different countries. Uh, this map here shows the distribution of these countries uh, from Saudi Arabia to Bahrain to Emirates, Jordan, Oman, Egypt, um, even Morocco, South Africa, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and Vietnam. Uh, the total investment for these assets is around $67.6 billion. Um, out of the 43.4 gigawatts of power, 35.7% comes from renew renewables. Uh, these renewables projects are basically the solar CSP, the solar photovoltaics, the PV, and also wind. We have 3,500 employees from over 30 nationalities, with the focus on the local employment in projects of around 60%. Here I'm showing, showing to you uh, some breakthroughs in the previous few years. Uh, we are leading the consortium to power the Red Sea development project uh, that's gonna be powered 100% by renewable energy. Uh, Aquapower has the world's largest CSP plant in Emirates uh, with a capacity of 950 megawatts. Uh, we also hold the world's lowest CSP tariff in the Emirates. Um, I believe that tariff is around $7.3 cents per kilowatt hour. Aquapower also has the world's largest reverse osmosis plant, uh, that is in Rabakh 3, uh, with a capacity of 600,000 cubic meter per day of desalinated water. Uh, we also have the largest PV plant in Saudi Arabia, which is the Sakaka uh, power plant. It's around 300 megawatts, and I'll talk about this in, in more details in, 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 in the slides. Uh, we also have the world's lowest PV tariff um, in Saudi Arabia. Around, uh, it's around one cent dollar per kilowatt hour. Aquapower also has the largest wind farm in Central Asia, uh, specifically in Uzbekistan. Uh, it's comprised of three different projects with a total capacity of around 1.1 gigawatts. Uh, Aquapower also has the, uh, the first and largest green hydrogen project in Saudi Arabia, specifically in Neom. The capacity of this project is going to, going to be 650 tons of green hydrogen per day and is powered by four gigawatts of renew, renewable energy. And it's going to be a mix between wind and solar photovoltaic. Okay, so now let's dig deeper into the PV projects in the kingdom. Here's a map showing the, the aqua power projects in the kingdom. Uh, the first is, the, uh, is operational, which is the Sakaka uh, PV project with a capacity of 300 megawatts. Uh, it's around the Jof region. And we uh, currently have two projects under construction. The Soder project, 1,500 megawatts close to Riyadh. And also the Red Sea project, which I mentioned earlier, is going to be powered by 100% renewables and specifically by photovoltaics with a capacity of 340 megawatts. Other projects are currently under the advanced development, uh, such as Shaiba, which is 600 megawatts, Grayat in the north, 200 megawatts, Ras, which is 700 megawatts, and also the Neom Green Hydrogen, where the portion uh, of uh, photovoltaic uh, capacity will be announced soon. So now let's talk about the Sakaka PV project, which is the 300 megawatt uh, project. Uh, it's the first ever utility scale renewable energy project under the National Renewable Energy Program of Saudi Arabia. The uptaker is the Saudi Power Procurement. Uh, the project has been operational since the second quarter of 2020 with a project cost of around 300 million USD. The project is based on a power purchase agreement and the project duration is around 25 years. Uh, the APC is a consortium between Mahindra and Chin Solar. So now if we focus more, I'm showing you here a picture of, of the actual PV plant, the Sakaka PV plant. And you can see that it's quite massive. To give a bit of a perspective, I highlighted here in red on the pie chart, for example, the area of the project, which is six square kilometers. 
The project has almost 1.2 PV modules and 13,400 trackers. These are, these are single access trackers. So one would wonder how do we actually maintain this project in terms of soiling? How do we clean it? So the way we do it is that we implement a cleaning strategy, uh, which, is, uh, which is basically the attractor-based cleaning. And uh, this, this, this cleaning strategy has shown to, to, to be effective in keeping an average soiling loss below 1%. So obviously, based on the two years of operational, cleaning it is highly effective. However, in terms of cost effectiveness, it's not super cost effective. And the reason why is because the way it's, uh, it's implemented, we have tractors that are obviously are operated by manpower, that they have to go between these trackers, all of these rows of trackers, and clean the modules even using water. So obviously it's not the best solution. So that's why we move towards robotic cleaning. So the goal here is to optimize the effective cleaning while minimizing the cleaning cost. At Aquapower, we like to consider ourselves as the leaders in PV module cleaning because we take commercially available robots and we transform them from just robots to a fully automatic robotic cleaning systems, or in short, ARCs. We achieve this by developing a design compatibility testing, testing strategy that we implement in, in, in all of our PV projects at the moment. Uh, we also developed our own ARCs technical specification, which actually showcased that using ARCs are more cost effective compared to the traditional manual cleaning or the semi-automatic cleaning. Uh, we've been testing and we're still testing over more than 17 robotic cleaning suppliers from Saudi Arabia to China, India, and much more. So if you have questions wondering how does this ARC system works? So here I'm showing you a layout of a, of a typical installation. So I'm gonna start here by the docking station. So you can think of the docking station as the parking of the, of the, of the robot. And you can see here in the picture how the, the, the robot is parked and that's, that's, a, that's a, a, a station basically. And then when cleaning has to start, the robot moves out of the docking station. So we go right, right, right side, and then it jumps into the tracker. This is a single access tracker with the PV modules and starts cleaning the robot's module, uh, sorry, the, the modules module by module until it reaches this gap. So this gap is called, a, there is a gap because of the slew gear, or I can explain it. It's basically the motor that controls the tracker rotation. So a way to, to, to overcome this gap is by using this fixed bridges, or you can see it here. It's a, it's a simple structure that allows the robot to move and jump over this gap. Once the robot moves over this gap through the fixed bridges, it will keep moving until it reaches the end of the tracker. So obviously now we can add an extra robot or robotic system for the next adjacent tracker. However, however it's not a cost-effective solution. So what we do is we install what we call a flexible bridge, which you can see here in this picture. So you can, you'll be wondering, why do we use a flexible bridge? Well, because in real installations, it's really rare or, or seldom that two adjacent trackers are perfectly aligned together in terms of the angle mismatch or even the height. So that's why we, we use a flexible bridge to make sure that when there is an angular misalignment or any kind of misalignment, the fixed bridge does not break and the flexible bridge stays uh, intact and does not get deattached when there is a, a, some kind of a misalignment. And obviously the, fix, the flexible bridge has to ensure that the tracker will pass through from one tracker to the other. Once it does that, the robot will go all the way again over this, the small gaps, which are using the fixed bridges to the return station here. Once it hit the return station, it will go back all the way to this docking station. And by going back and forth, that's considered a one, basically one cleaning trip. So now we already have 3,000, almost 3,800 robots already installed in PV projects. And we are looking to install another 6,100 robots in the next one or two years. And we would like to reach uh, a total quantity of robots of 20,000. Ro projects that are being implementing, let's say the ARC uh, solutions are around 14 projects at the moment in Equipower. Here, I'm gonna show you some videos that showcase the, the cleaning of the robots and how they, they actually work.
Okay, it seems like I'm having some kind of a technical issue. The the video is not playing. Okay, uh, apologies for this. Um, so ba basically, this video was supposed to show you how effective the the, the cleaning of the robot is. Um, uh, maybe we can we can see here from 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 this image of the video. Uh, basically, before cleaning and after cleaning, the the robots are quite effective in in, in terms of cleaning. Um, the, the second video was supposed to showcase basically the, the movement of the tracker and how does it uh, go over the gap specifically back to the to the docking station. Apologies for the for the technical issue. Okay, so moving to future innovative uh, perspective, I think there is several topics that are quite important. Uh, one of them is to validate commercially available soiling stations. Obviously, uh, a lot of the previous speakers talked about um, uh, different techniques of, uh, let's say, quantifying the soiling loss, and I think it's of extreme importance. At the moment, there is one commercially available um, solution, which is the Dust IQ from Kip and Zonen. Uh, the way it works is basically it's a device that you install along the array of the, of, of the PV modules. It gets cleaned whenever you clean the modules. It doesn't um, basically doesn't require any external devices or external mechanical uh, movements. The way it works is that there is an LED inside the sensor and also a photodiode that captures the reflected light. And you calibrate once the, the device is clean and takes that as a, as, a, as, a, as a calibration. Once the device is soiled, then it measures the reflection, how the reflection is changed. And based on that, it quantifies the soiling loss. Um, however, it's, it's very important to always validate these kind of solutions, and it's also quite important, and I hope some, some of the young students are motivated enough to come with a, a new soiling stations techniques, as it's of uh, extreme importance, and obviously there's always some kind of an error when it comes to these kind of solutions. It's, it's important to, to, to quantify these errors. Another important topic is to develop, to develop a soiling prediction model. Obviously, this uh, uh, prediction models of soiling is very important for future projects when it comes to bedding, and also is quite important for operation and maintenance. And I also would like to highlight here that this kind of modeling is not just important for PV projects, but also for CSP projects. Another topic with, which is a lot of other previous speakers talked about, which is the anti-soiling coating. Obviously, it's an extreme importance. Uh, Anti-soiling coating can uh, reduce the amount of uh, cleaning. However, it's really also important to, to highlight that anti-soiling coating will not, um, let's say, eliminate the need for cleaning of the modules. So other than the, the, the benefits of reducing the soiling loss, it's really important to also validate the effect of cleaning of the soiling coating. For example, when you use brushes, the, the robotic cleaning, what is the effect on the coating itself? Uh, does it degrade or does it not degrade? And also the lifetime of, of the soiling coating. And obviously there is another um, important point when it comes to the commercialization of these soiling coating is uh, how do you commercialize it? Uh, will, you, is it will, will it be coated by the PV manufacturer or will it be coated by the, the, the glass supplier for the PV modules? or will it be coated by the end users such as AquaPower? And last but not least is uh, another important topic is using machine learning to find the optimal cleaning frequency. Obviously this strategy can reduce a lot the, the, the cost of cleaning by, by controlling the frequency of cleaning and having, having a better cost effective uh, project. Uh, with this, I would thank you for listening. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, for the excellent presentation. Uh, so I have a question, actually, when you showed the map of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, we, we saw that most of your uh, well-established projects or the one that under construction is located toward the eastern or to the north part of Saudi Arabia. Does it have anything with the geographical location or? Um... Well, most of these projects is, is basically we, uh, AquaPower is answering the calls of the NREP program. And uh, obviously it's based on, um, you know, bidding and, and, you know, 
the, the competitive of, of uh, comp competitiveness of our bids. It's not it's not something that is quite targeted. Let's say. Okay. Uh, another question, and unfortunately, the videos of your robotic system is not working. Uh, the, the 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 type of cleaning is it a dry cleaning or is there is any water involved with the rotating uh, uh, brushing? Yeah, so for the Sakaka project, uh, it's actually has it's using water, but for all the other the the projects after Sakaka, it's all using dry cleaning robotic cleaning solutions. So no water. No water. Yeah. Okay. Also, there is another question is. Uh, for because I was reviewing the the some of uh, uh, robotic technique uh, strategies for 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 solar panels, always there is a limitation of the inclination of solar panels. Mm -hmm. Like example, uh, yeah, yeah. Here, for example, if we take a Dharana as an example, we had uh, when you are planning to have a new like a new uh, solar farm, it should be with the uh, the latitude of the local uh, or, or the place that you are. Mm -hmm. are constructing it. For mm -hmm. example, the Ecobia, they have some type of robots that cannot perform well after five degree inclination. So mm -hmm. what are, how we are dealing with such problems? So we are working closely with the suppliers. Um, I would say most of our projects that we're implementing the robotic cleaning is on single access tracking. So the way, the way it happens or it works is basically you see when the robot is at is a docking station, uh, basically it's at a fixed angle. And then when the cleaning happens, basically the trackers align at the same angle and then it moves along the trackers. And most of the suppliers, I would say, is capable of, of uh, moving at various angles, but not at a extremely sharp angles. Okay. Also, uh, there is a question, sorry. There is a question that, uh, somebody is asking for the, the cleaning reports to show the flexible bridge by working method. Is there is any way to send us the video maybe after the presentation so we can share it with him? Uh, yes, I'll look into this. Um, All right. Let, also, let me check now if I can if I can play the video. Even when I'm outside of the full screen, it's not playing. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll look into sharing the video. I'm, I'm really sorry for this technical issue. Uh, there is also a question by Dr. Bing. Uh, mm -hmm. He said thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for uh, the very informative uh, presentation. So he said, you mentioned 14 cleaning projects. Mm -hmm. Are the cleaning reports from different uh, manufacturers? Cleaning reports from a different manufacturers. Uh, you mean like in-house reports that, we, we, that we, we developed in our own projects or cleaning reports from the manufacturers that for, they did in their own sites? For cleaning projects. Sorry? For the mentioned 14 cleaning projects, Correct. are they using cleaning report, uh, robots from different manufacturers? Yes. So obviously these 14 projects, not all of them are already operational. So some of them are operational and some of them are under advanced... Uh, um, advanced uh, development, but yes, we, we we not all of the the projects have exactly the same supplier, but we have different suppliers for different projects. Okay. Uh, also, there is a question from uh, Dr. Abdullah Sharafi. He said, uh, "What is the frequency of uh, the cleaning process?" That's a good question uh, for the robotic cleaning. Yes. Okay, for the robotic cleaning is usually almost uh, twice per day, depending obviously on the soiling uh, ratio. And uh, this is something that also we will we are looking into uh, understanding, is it required to do it uh, twice a day or just once a day is in, uh, enough uh, from a cost effective uh, point of view? Okay, that's good. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed, for the sure. very excellent presentation. Thank uh, you so much for having me. Uh, uh, I'll invite Dr. Fahad to close the, the event. Dr. Fahad, please. Assalamu alaikum again. I would like to welcome all the speakers and uh, the organizer uh, for uh, preparing this uh, event and for the speaker for the well said uh, and well presented uh, in information. It was really very informative uh, forum 
uh, a lot of uh, new insights. Uh, we understand uh, many different challenges, uh, some potential solutions, and I think the, still the path is uh, long, relatively long to resolve this uh, challenge for uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, as will many other places where they uh, where there is uh, dust and windstorm. Uh, I would like to welcome, uh, I would like to thank again uh, Dr. Ali Sheikhi, the Vice President, uh, Dr. Uh, Bing, uh, Dr. Hussein Al Qahtani, Dr. Abdullah Sharafi, Dr. Hussam Ghassim, Dr. Malaya Muzmadar, uh, Dr. Shafiq Al Rahman, and uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Balawi. As well, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hassan for helping uh, me to organize this event, in addition to Dr. Abdullah Sharafi and Dr. Amir Al Ahmed. Uh, thanks again for joining us for this event. And uh, inshallah, we have a plan to, for other events uh, relevant to other challenges uh, of reno renewable energy applications in Saudi Arabia. Thank you again, and have a nice uh, night.